Καλησπέρα σα. Καλώ ήρθατε στο συμπόσιο. Καλώ Welcome to the um, the symposium on women in international security. This is our first special uh, event. thinking that we should focus on and learn about and about uh, about uh, inclusive security i have to particularly thank all of you who are present here today under these difficult uh, circumstances due to the pandemic and uh, of course traffic in athens including, of course, um, the hectic lifestyle of everyone. You're real heroes to have made it here. Uh, even more so, I have to mention particularly Mrs. Vultepsi, who even more so, who uh, honors us with uh, her presence. Our participants from abroad, our speakers from abroad, and we hope it will be a useful um, experience. We hope you will be able to understand a little bit more of what we in Greece uh, believe about security. And we would also welcome your comments and your feedback on the discussions that we should start and uh, enlarge, possibly. Uh, special Thanks to Ariella Blatter, the president of WIS Global. WIS Global has given. Special thanks to Ms. Ariella Blatter, um, president of Women International Security. This organization um, gave us uh, the spur, triggered actually. Um, to get us to speak um, more uh, in more detail and um, wider as a discussion that has become more intense in recent years, especially recent times. And uh, why should it be enlarged or wider this discussion? Well, uh, research uh, on security in Greece, or rather, if we run a search of the word security in Greece, one would get a home security, um, um, financial security, etc. But human uh, security will order, would also be mentioned only in scientific groups because human security or inclusive security, as it is called, people's security, inclusive security, was a concept that uh, we did not uh, uh, consider a lot because we hadn't understood what it means to feel safe and secure in the current time of uh, this pandemic being uh, feeling secure becomes more concrete uh, secure from what it's not only borders it's not only not having a house burned down it's also about being able to um, circulate to meet our, our people um, without fear, without um, anxiety, and uh, of course, uh, without uh, being, being in dire need. We will talk about the various dimensions, because uh, human security has got a lot of dimensions. I'd like to pass the floor first to Mrs. Afedouli, who is going to give us a more specific dimension or other. Uh, let me put it otherwise. Mrs. Afedouli will give us, will explain how international organization that used to be this uh, typical security, international security organization, military security organization is being transformed or wishes to be transformed into an organization that will deliver human security. Mrs. Safedouli. And then we're going to open the discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. The microphone is off. Okay, good. I believe you can hear me now. Thank you warmly. I th 
wish to thank uh, warmly the Greek chapter of uh, WIAS. We thank you for setting up this Greek chapter. It's very uh, useful, as indicated by this event and its content. Uh, I thank the minister for being present here today. And I hope that this uh, discussion will be fruitful. And also thank for the collaboration with um, the WBP um, the, the NATO Public Diplomacy Di uh, Directorate and uh, the opportunity you give me to talk about uh, the forthcoming uh, steps, the next steps of uh, the new security environment um, and uh, the role of international organizations in this environment. Of course, I'm going to talk about NATO. Talking about NATO, I believe we talk about an organization, a Euro-Atlantic organization with uh, a strong European component. Hence, uh, the priority given that has been given in recent years uh, to the collaboration with the European Union. The European Union is a strategic partner of the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization because the, the threats, challenges, uh, opportunities uh, emerging in this new security environment concern both NATO member states as well as uh, EU member states. After all, NATO member states are also EU member states in their majority. So we're talking in the light of some findings or of some learnings uh, in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic, which actually is not over yet. The pandemic, the developments, technological developments rather, space developments, cybersecurity developments. All these challenges of our times do not have the traditional security dimension. They are uh, immaterial, intangible, and uh, mostly invisible. And let me add to this, cl the climate crisis, and I will explain why. And I will also add the population movements, which is uh, the, uh, and the migration, which uh, is the portfolio of Mrs. Vultepsi. And these two are two are, are major issues for international organizations. This is why both NATO and the EU are looking for a compass for the forthcoming uh, decade. This is why consultation in NATO is titled NATO 2030. So we're talking about how NATO challenges will be dealt with in the next uh, 10 years. Other countries have uh, borrowed this title. President Macron is talking about uh, the 2030 agenda, and so do the United Nations. Why is this decade uh, so critical? It's not only for communication purposes, because industrial organizations and national environment um, like to adopt mottos. Well, I believe that uh, this 2030 agenda is not only uh, for communication purposes, but it is quite substantial and we, it will come to life when at the end of the current consultation between the Allies about the new strategic doctrine, we will have some direction as to how the North Atlantic Treaty Organization will evolve in the next 10 years. And uh, as you know, this is also true for the European Union in the context of the so-called uh, strategic uh, com com compass. 
a strategic concept for NATO, a strategic compass for the EU. And um, these two are so close to each other because there are at least 74 common actions in the two agendas. So let's talk about the security terms. Why do we need to um, reconfigure some uh, security items? Because um, issues, because but the pandemic has proven that issues that are not military, not even political, but healthcare issues have a major impact on people's security safety and security in uh, the uh, in the in NATO member states the movement of populations the climate crisis are also two areas that uh, concern our organization because the climate crisis is not a bubble as uh, it has uh, proved given the major changes that we've seen we've, we've observed in our country as well the climate uh, crisis has been scientifically found that will drive uh, t population flows, especially f from uh, Africa. These population flows will move towards, um, will be headed north. Europe is the continent of reception, like it or not, is the most accessible continent. And uh, the Mediterranean Basin is the first start uh, station and our country along with Italy and Spain are the first reception countries so we will have to join forces to deal with this challenge I wouldn't want to talk about um, a threat I don't know that we, whether weak and desperate people can pose a threat in the um, typical uh, meaning of the term, but it is an issue that uh, needs to be dealt with collectively by institutions, Euro-Atlantic and European uh, institutions, because no single country can shoulder this burden on its own, as has been demonstrated since uh, 2015. So climate uh, crisis, climate change, uh, population movements uh, are on the agenda for uh, the forthcoming uh, period, and of course, uh, digitization. And the the digita digitization of defense and security is also something that should concern us. Let me explain what I mean. The military dimension that you talked about, uh, Mrs. Mitsako, is always on the table because there are threats, there are military threats. There is a defense dimension, both in the traditional uh, meaning of the term and non-traditional. For instance, the information war is a major dimension when it comes to international relations and foreign policy. And the information war, or the war of the wars, so the information war is uh, cheap. It's economical. You don't need to spend billion to run a campaign on the internet to misinform populations, to influence the public opinion, to influence specific social classes or social groups that can have a say in, uh, during elections or uh, when setting a trend uh, or to weaken the government, to strengthen other forces. I believe you'll understand what I mean. So this is a dimension that security organizations need to take into account in forthcoming years. and. Uh, Another one, of course, is uh, cyber attacks. Experts can easily <coughs> launch uh, cyber attacks very easily 
and without needing without requiring a lot of uh, equipment a lot of gear a cyber attack uh, on uh, the communication system on the electric grid can um, paralyze the entire country another dimension that i'd like to mention and I'm not going to speak uh, very long, because, I promise, because I wouldn't want the minister to wait for long, is that of uh, technological development for the reasons that I've already mentioned. Anyone who has technological edge will be will have an advantage in international competition and i believe that this is the most important reason why we in nato in the us in the european union to a large extent we are um, worried about the technological evolution uh, of china advancement or rather of China because uh, currently uh, the US uh, holds uh, is ahead uh, in terms of technology and uh, this uh, gives the US also a defense uh, advantage but even in the forthcoming years China becomes the forerunner, there's going to be an issue for uh, the rest of us because we don't know how China will deal with the rest of the world, whether it's going to be opportunity or a threat, whether it's going to be a will for cooperation or competition, what kind of competition, would it be financial, economic, uh, or, or military competition. So I'll stop here, and uh, I believe that we'll have the opportunity, if you so wish, uh, if, if the participants so wish rather to raise their questions and um, share their comments and feedback. Thank you very much for this invitation. I also thank you uh, and the organization for this beautiful event uh, that you are holding and of course the ones uh, to come and I'll be at your disposal for any feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Afenduli, truly, all that you've just said uh, for us, uh, maybe the slightly older ones, they, they sound horrifying. I believe the younger generation find the, all these things more normal, so to speak, but that doesn't mean that uh, they are not the fourth industrial revolution, so we are experiencing a radical change of all that we've known so far. We're going to make a slight change. We uh, give the floor to Ms. Blatter from the U.S., uh, the president of WIS Global, the organization that, um, or rather, we let her say what they do. They do a lot of things and we try to imitate some, to implement others, and uh, create more opportunities for women basically involved in international security, uh, in human security, in international relations, and generally we want to promote women in uh, leadership positions, like a major leader that I have on my right, that she will have the floor later on. Ariela, connected. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I want to check that my audio is coming through. I'm delighted to participate in today's symposium discussing inclusive security. This is a, a very timely conversation coinciding with uh, tomorrow's International Day for the Elimination of Violence and marking the recent 21st anniversary of UN Security Council resolution. 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Misakos and YSLF for the invitation, along with the Greek Association for Atlantic and European Cooperation and NATO's Public Diplomacy Division for its support. I'm honored to be talking amongst such distinguished speakers and an audience comprised of governing representatives from Greece, the EU, and of course, NATO. I'd also like to use this occasion to congratulate the founder of Wise Italy, Irene Fallon, 
for her appointment as the NATO Security General Special Representative for Women, Peace, and Security. Women in International Security, or WISE, is the premier organization in the world dedicated to advancing the leadership and professional development of women in the international security field. In 2022, WISE will be celebrating its 35th anniversary as the leading global network promoting women's advancement and gender equality in the peace and security sector. We have members in roughly 50 countries focused on research projects and policy engagement initiatives on critical international security issues bridging the gap between gender and security. Since WISE was founded in 1987, women have advanced to increasingly important international security roles. There are new and expanding opportunities for women's participation globally as women present in greater numbers in foreign and defense affairs and occupy positions in governments around the world. But equal representation of women is not a reality. The November 2021 Security Global Index concluded that women remain underrepresented in all areas of security. Uh, globally, we see a little over a quarter of members of national parliaments are women. And while this is a twofold increase over the last 21 years, there is clearly a lot of work to be done. But this work is much harder now due to the COVID-19 pandemic and this gendered recession in the global economy. The 2021 World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap indicated that closing the gender gap has increased now from 99 years to over 135. But I want to emphasize that this gap is even more pronounced in relation to people of color and members of the LGBTQIA community. Continued efforts to achieve gender parity must focus on an inclusive intersectional approach reflected in the WPS agenda and implemented nationally. So moving forward, the WPS agenda cannot be applied as a heteronormative framework. If we truly want change to occur, WPS and initiatives stemming from it must be intersectional. We must amplify, recognize, and create space for LGBTQ LGBT, LGBTQIA plus and persons of color within the conversation. And for those of us with that privileged access to the conversation, we must stand in solidarity. A great example would be the orgs and solidarity group created by women of color advancing peace and security, which WISE has been a member of since its inception. In examining two decades of lessons learned, a major focus must be centering the human experience. Um, and and certainly, or human security. We can do this by passing laws to protect persons of color and LGBTQIA plus persons from discrimination and violence and directing resources to BIPOC led civil society and elevating local activism on, on violence prevention. A second major challenge I wanted to mention is this persistent data gap. The security index makes the case that the remaining data gaps in diplomacy, military and police remain a barrier to gender advancement. And while we have data, better data on women in the military than other sectors, thanks largely to NATO, the picture it paints is modest or incomplete. Uh, in 2019, NATO reported that 12% of full-time military forces in its members were women. And this figure, while it has doubled since 1999, there's still considerable room for improvement. And, and further gains could come at the top level. At that last NATO defense ministers meeting, for instance, eight out of 30 ministers were women. Uh, and earlier this year, uh, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg announced a NATO 2030 agenda, a compass uh, charting a course for NATO to remain steady, strong, and united uh, in a new era, era of increased global competition. In doing so, he identified advancing gender equality as a priority, urging, quote, all allies to recruit more women in their military, and noting diverse armed forces are strong armed forces, end quote. Looking at NATO's member state data, there is a way to go realizing this agenda. As of 2019, 59% of NATO member states reportedly do not have policies in place to promote recruitment of women. And 74% of member states do not have specific retention policies targeting women in the military. On the positive side, 96% of member states now incorporate gender perspectives into pre-deployment training. However, one of WISE's recommendations to NATO has been to ensure that gender training is part and parcel of basic training and not limited to pre-deployment training. 
In fact, WISE launched its 1325 scorecard at NATO headquarters in 2015. The 1325 scorecard is a tool to evaluate how well the principles of the UN Security Council have been implemented within NATO's armed forces. And it's provided NATO and partner states ideas um, on how to implement and improve implementation. And further, it helps to uh, standardize and ensure operability and interoperability among NATO allies. In addition to the basic training recommendation that I just mentioned, uh, there were several other recommendations that are important to uh, continue as part of the discourse. Uh, that would include appointing a gender advisor at the Supreme Allied Commander level, uh, institutionalizing the incorporation of gender analysis and gender perspectives in all aspects of military operations. Gender perspectives should be integrated in all major national security strategies and policy directives including military directives and guidance documents. And finally, that NATO toot its own horn, so publicize the efforts to integrate the principles of UN SCR 1325 into national security policies and institutions. And I think a partnership like today is, is one uh, wonderful step in that direction. And we at WISE Global look forward to partnering again with NATO to update our research. I look forward to hearing more from our speakers and distinguished guests on how we can ensure the WPS agenda and NATO 2030 can make inclusive security a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Ariella. We're applauding, all of us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Those daring of us. <laughs> um, you've raised a lot of issues and when issue actually that I have been thinking all along for some time now is we are women in international security. And of course there are no men in international security but definitely the majority is there. And then you raised all the other communities and then uh, the basic issue of inclusivity and how we are human beings. And this is something that um, I realized actually that I was not a simple human being, but a woman years ago when I started my professional career. Until then I thought men and women are the same. We have give, been given the same opportunities to, to uh, grow, whatever. Anyway, um, all these issues that you mentioned and Ino mentioned before you, and there are Kane Simon, Shaka, Pira Fora. Does it matter? All the issues raised, uh, Ms. Blatter spoke of women and security. About the diversity of groups and the differences due to color, sexual orientation. And of course, the issue of uh, population movements that Ms. Avedouli raised um, earlier. And this is a huge discussion that we've been having in Greece in recent years. Uh, Greece, which is the transit point of people, not women or men. But yeah, yeah there's a distinction there. But people who are in search of a better future. Now, all these people that come here and they are weak, maybe even not having the necessary knowledge on various levels, uh, are a threat, sort of a threat for the local populations, not only in Greece, but in Italy, in Spain, and all the countries of reception. But another uh, special group of these people are children. And children come here, arrive, and sometimes uh, arrive unaccompanied, they come by themselves. Miss Vultepsi, for whom I'm going to reiterate that she's an excellent example of a woman who is very productive, very hands-on, and now she is dealing with this very sensitive issue of 
unaccompanied refugee children who come here unprotected in a completely strange environment to them. You have the floor, uh, Ms. Vultepsi. Thank you very much, Aliki. Yes, it is an issue that that's of great concern to us and the issue of security and with Thanasis Kozopoulos we've spent many hours discussing and I see here Thodoris Papa Theodoru and I heard Inno I'm going to refer to what Inno said uh, I'm, uh, I do apologize that I have a very very heavy schedule and I won't be able to stay long but uh, I would have liked to participate in the discussion because I see Katarina Boru here, but you understand, Mr. Chairman, we said the people here are actually people who have actually worked on this. And I heard Ino saying, just let me just say, start by saying something general, for the new pressures that the European Union will experience from the region of Africa. You remember there was recently a discussion about Sahel and there was, it was an issue of political uh, controversy, but uh, Sahel, this, this, this belt, which is in, in essence covers 10 African countries and it is in, it's now in the hands of terror uh, under ISIS, there are people who are in constant risk, women being raped, mass executions, more than one million children starving. This in order for these populations to get away from ISIS, they move from one region to another because Sahel is not one country, it's a, it's a region. So all these people, since they are constant movement, constantly moving, they are uh, exert pressure towards the Mediterranean basin. And oh, as Ino said, these people, you know, the first countries they will meet in their travels are our countries, the countries of the south. I believe that valuable time has been lost in the migration issue until we've reached an agreement on how to address the overall uh, issue. If we should address it uh, following a logic of, uh, uh, of an intercultural uh, logic uh, or looking at it from a security point of view. Security does not mean that I won't accept somebody to come near me, but uh, it means that I will have to teach him to behave in such a way that to ensure that everybody is safe, both myself and them. So uh, for many years in Greece, especially after the crisis, there was a logic that said, OK, now we, they have these views in their country. That's what they've learned in their country. This is how we should accept them. But no, that's a, a logic that leads to ghettos, leads to social marginalization and leads to, the, to radicalization. We are very fortunate here in Greece with all that we know that has happened and what we've experienced, what we've seen, we are very fortunate to be secure. Indeed, uh, I have inclusion uh, and unaccompanied refugee children in my portfolio. Now, this is not something that just happened. But what we do to address this issue is connected, is related with a political will, a political decision. This is why in the period that I've held this portfolio, I've revisited our national strategy because I believe that we cannot achieve inclusion unless somebody shares your concern with you. And, you, and as a result, you cannot have security. Therefore, I revisited the, the curriculum in the camps and wherever there are education tray programs for uh, for migrants and refugees, and there is also a pre-accession stage because even if these people, don't say because the the asylum we offer does not last forever, it is revisited, re-evaluated based on the conditions in the countries of origin. Uh, so as long as the origins of countries are in emergency, then we are obliged from the Geneva Convention to ho uh, host these people. So when there is no longer an emergency in the countries of origin, this is why there is a revaluation. These people need to return to their country and go somewhere else where they feel they have to go. But the pre-accession stage is important because even if those who will not stay in Greece, but even in 
the next stage that follows does not mean that they will all stay in our countries forever. It's very important because they are taught values, they are taught a concept that they would never be taught in their countries. So even if they go back to their countries or if they go to any other countries, they will make sure to ensure the safety, their own safety, the safety of their families. And this is why the new curriculum includes new subjects so as to familiarize them with the European lifestyle, the European way of living. I will not accept the fact that we, since somebody comes from another uh, culture, they will come here and they beat up their wife. No, I will never accept this. And I didn't like it at look that in Greece, for a little while, the view prevailed that that's what have they learned, that's what, no, that's not it. You are a guest here, you are coming to this country, you need to obey by the rules of this country. I have also included gender equality, avoidance of family violence and any sort of violence. Uh, we, this is something we experience every day. I will not accept that somebody beats his pregnant wife. He goes to jail, a woman, a wife goes to the hospital, and there's three baby babies alone in the camp. We cannot have it in this country. We cannot accept this. We cannot turn a blind eye to a situation like this. It, it takes a lot of effort. This is not easy. Maybe it's easier to see that uh, in practice in single parent families, in women of single parent families. So what we're trying to do is to do two things at a time. Why? Because uh, Greece had to address the uh, refugee crisis along with another crisis, the 10-year economic crisis, the uh, attempt uh, to breach our northern borders, uh, which was almost a threat for a national sovereignty because somebody used this human tool, migrants and refugees, people who didn't know, they were misinformed, they were given uh, con conflicting and false information and uh, took them to the border. And we had to address the pandemic as well. All this happened in two years. So these past two years, if we if we just think of it, uh, um, I'm mentioning this to our foreign interlocutors because they all have very good ideas and views and they're ready to, 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 to point a finger. But all, all this time, there was no other country in the world, even the most dangerous uh, high risk areas in terms of uh, of security there was no other country in the position where our country found itself and for the for two years we had all our state on alert the armed forces the police the uh, the coast guard and with the pandemic, we had to uh, raise the alert for of our health services, and we had to put the entire public and private sector of the country on alert because we all participate in this in order to be able to ensure our security. Naturally, migration flows are the result of geostrategic developments, but the way in which we address an upcoming immigration crisis or a developing migration crisis has to do with political will and what i'm always what i've always been saying that it's necessary to find that balance point between protecting the borders and protecting people and their rights human rights as a reception countries we have been in the front line for years what we're trying to do is at the same time guard our borders and also offer humanitarian aid to those people who reach our country and are in need of our help. And these are two concepts that are not incompatible. They are complementing each other. I will not accept what is being said that since you're guarding the borders, you cannot be humanitarian. No, that's not it's because in a chaos, you can help those in need. Which country is in a position to help one million people suddenly arriving in their uh, territory. In practice, this cannot happen. It's not uh, humanitarianism. It is just pretext. Now, what I'm trying to say is that Greece observes all international conventions 
and it observes the Geneva Convention for the Status of Refugees, the 1951 Convention. Greece ratified this convention in 1959 because for Greece, observing international convention is an existential matter. The existence of our country is based on conventions, on international convention. So Greece would never, never breach international convention. Now, a very important aspect of this issue, apart from from uh, inclusion, are the unaccompanied minors. Why am I saying this? Because when our government came to power, We had approximately, there were approximately five and a half thousand children that were unaccompanied, very small children, but also older children, 14, 15, 16 years old. Uh, somebody could uh, approach them and radicalize them. So when they, these children were in, in camps, you know, just like that, without any support whatsoever, they were indeed very, very vulnerable. What we did immediately is to bring all these children together to know where they are and introduce them in condition of security. Otherwise, this was a potential problem because these children, they were by themselves, without their family. Imagine coming from the other end of the world without speaking the language, without being able to communicate, without having any friends. Uh, traveling in very difficult conditions, so these children had to survive. And it's difficult for one to survive in the jungle of Moria or in the favela of Vathi in Samos, because that was not humanitarianism. It, even today, as we speak today, every time that uh, that a boat manages to reach our coast, because uh, our the borders are there and they are guarded, if we assume that the boat has 100 people, 50 are children, and half of that 50 are unaccompanied children. So we have company, we have arrivals of, uh, of very vulnerable age. If you go to Ritsona now, uh, 2,000 people, out of which 1,000 are children and young people. So unless they are protected, uh, unless they are kept protected and secured in a specific area where the, the state can help and provide education, then there's a problem. So if for us it was elementary, it was essential to find the children and start caring for the children and ensuring their education because the first thing that a child learns when they get off the boat is that in Greece education is mandatory therefore it's mandatory for them today we are hosting approximately 2200 unaccompanied refugee children uh, the number uh, changes constantly because we are continuing a very successful relocation uh, program in other European countries, always European countries, we want to ensure the European protocols to ensure uh, protection of the children. And it changes because every day that we have arrivals. Now, in March 2020, for this very reason, by order of Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, uh, we had the General Secretariat for the Protection of uh, uh, Unaccompanied Minors, which is my portfolio, and we immediately started a relocation pro program. The first relocation of children was conducted in April 2020, and then we had set uh, a, a, a target to, ma to relocate a thousand unaccompanied children. Uh, last April, we broke these barriers of a thousand children. Now we have approximately 1,100, and now we have two large groups uh, ready to be relocated, and we will uh, have almost 1,200 children relocated by early December. This this pioneering program has not been implemented anywhere in the world in such a systematic manner. I need to say that it was implemented inside uh, th while there was a pandemic with closed airports, closed borders, conditions were such that we had to have huge 
negotiations and combine many people in order to ensure to release one flight. For example, there was a flight that had to go, we had to fly out uh, to Croatia, 11 children that had to fly out to Croatia. There was no flight. They flew over to, uh, to the Netherlands and there was another plane taking them to Croatia. So the, the, in, at the same time, we managed to transfer 1,035 people to Germany, of which 620 children that were severely ill, and now they are in German hospitals. For Greece, this was considerable help, because there's 620 children that would have to take up 620 beds in hospitals. So there's a, there's a number of countries helping us, helping us, uh, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Lithuania, Luxembourg, uh, Italy, uh, Luxembourg, Lithuania, Switzerland. We're talking about uh, uh, solidarity. You have uh, half countries operating in the in the field of uh, solidarity. Other half countries uh, have started to offering uh, solidarity in a voluntary basis. I don't understand that. Uh, I, I don't understand why there is this solidarity on a voluntary basis. I don't understand why this is happening. That's why we, we constantly exert pressure. Now, why do we do these relocations? Because uh, every country and Greece has a specific uh, carrying capacity to uh, support children. We can support two and a half thousand children. If we have permanently two and a half thousand children here, we can take care of them because they have specific structures, they have security, and the, 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 all this is hard. And each country has specific capabilities. So, what do we do? We want to uh, help uh, transfer children safely in other countries so that the children who come, we to, in order to allow us to be, we want to be able to save and help children that arrive. Even in the, when they are relocated, the, the children have been educated, they speak Greek, they speak some English, they, ha, they have uh, followed uh, uh, civil courses, so th there is, there, it is a very successful program. And sometimes they come back because, you know, there are children who want to leave. We've also uh, incru improved the uh, reunification of family. That is also very important because it's a program. Uh, the, you might have a, ch a child here and their family in the Netherlands or they've been left behind. You need to have another network to uh, carry out reunifications. We have carried all the unaccompanied minors from the islands and ever in properly prepared structures in the mainland in September when there was a fire in Moria, when Moria was destroyed. On this, in the same evening, we transported the last 450 children that were left there. And meanwhile, we've incle increased the long-term hospitality position and we'll cre create another 200 now. And we've stopped the temporary hosting in hotels because we've created structures because hotels are not the ideal place for children to stay. We had to make some other arrangements for their reception. Uh, and now we will stop uh, having children in safe zones in camps. We won't have any children in camps. They will all living in in special structures and semi-independent living uh, apartments and uh, after the well for the first time in our country there was systematic and extensive uh, effort to identify to uh, locate unaccompanied minors who have been in Greece since 2015 without any service looking for them and in the meantime they grew older they became adults etc etc so we have managed this we have found we have located 300 children in this situation in this status uh, they were not on the map so to speak and another important issue is that we found more than 300 children that lived actually in police stations in protective custody. <coughs> Since there was nowhere else for them to live, the children found themselves living 
in police stations, in cells, the police officers uh, caring for them in order to make sure they have the base necessity. This stop now, by law, it is prohibited for children to reside in police stations, and so we have an emergency response mechanism that uh, there is a L alert when a child is found on the road or that left a camp is in a boat or I don't know how one can move about because it's a free country immediately. These children are located and placed in proper structures to be able to continue their education. Think that, uh, consider that if you go to an unaccompanied children's structure, if there are 19 children living there, 16 of them attend school, a Greek public school. We think that this is a great success. It's going to be a great success for us in the future and something I've started to do that with other children, the children in the camps, because there was again the attitude uh, of uh, children, you know, getting off the boat, speaking Urdu, and they go to the public school because we, we, we go there to the public school. Why? Because we live all together. So, okay, a child goes to the school, they sit down with another child at 12 years. There are two, two 12 year old children or a 12-year-old child and a 15-year-old child, but they, they know nothing, they know, know the, the, the language, they cannot attend, they cannot follow the class, they, they, be, they are marginalized, and it's just, you know, the distorted idea that they go to school, but that's not a positive result. Uh, all this time I've been doing all these things, I had a huge financing gap, a gap and I wanted to fill it. And how we're going to find the the money from the new program? So I studied all these issues, and uh, when I uh, was always surprised, and I say, how how does a person get off a boat from another culture, another language, and they, you know they go to a public school? To, to and even our children find it difficult. So, so I've prepared a three-year program with UNICEF that uh, UNICEF uh, started it and, we, uh, and, and now uh, uh, is taken up by UNICEF for children to follow non-formal uh, just before the, f the formal uh, education. So there's going to be a bridge program between uh, uh, informal and formal education so that these children will be able to attend public school and not just say that, you know, they go to school or they attend school or... Uh, so with everybody needs to work together. In order together, we need to help the children, help the children, help their fellow pupils to... Uh, so that they can be useful for themselves and for society. To conclude, let me just say this. These children, the unaccompanied uh, refugee children, are not minors forever. They grow up. So when they grow up, the program ends. So there's these children who have studied, uh, they are educated. They have seen, they have uh, joined social life, they go to meet their friends, they go to sporting events with children from other schools. And, you know, at the end of the day, at 18 years old, the program is over, you open the door and you let them out. And there, the risk is much higher because the children who is in a very secure environment and then suddenly they found themselves out on the streets at 18 years old. This was also of concern for me in the first day I joined this position and I have prepared the Ilios Junior program which will start from 17 and a half years old until 21 and they want to go to university, fine. They want to be taught something else, find they want to have uh, some sort of other education and uh, start their professional life okay so we can have at our disposal three three and a half years so that the children reach 21 years be uh, included and be able to work in greece and also say that on we we need people uh, in very in, in a lot of uh, re, a lot of sectors in in agriculture in tourism in construction we need people we need worker and this will increase gdp will offer jobs to everyone both to greeks and to our guests especially the children uh, becoming adults 
I don't know if uh, it was too long. I tried to include it, everything. Thank you very much. Everything you shared was very important. I took note of a few words to comment upon, but what um, is, in my opinion, the key word is education, education and training, because based on my personal experience with migrant families, I've seen them living on the subsidies given by the higher commission of the UN, then children would be sent to some Greek school that they couldn't um, attend, they couldn't learn, they couldn't learn Greek, they couldn't learn anything. And that would go on until the financing was over. Then what? That used to be a major problem because uh, Greece is a country as we call it, uh, well, poor, but even if no poor, uh, limited uh, capabilities. Um, uh, and a population that is um, migrating itself. And now we have got people that gave the impression that have come here to get uh, the jobs from Greeks, and then what would Greeks ha what would happen to Greeks? And as I said, Greeks have started migrating abroad, and we have a, a similar problem of uh, brain drain, as we call it. Let me say something at this point. I told the Prime Minister as well, it might sound like a paradox, we have got uh, Great drain of refugees as well. Refugees who have come here, who had come here, who were uh, engineers, doctors, medical doctors, etc., and they were needed in other countries. They've already fled the country. They already left the country. This is very normal. This is something that Greece should do. Make sure that it keeps the brains here. We don't just. Of course, we need farmers, but we also need to have educated people here. We need good brains, quote unquote, to, for us to move forward. Another part of the Greek population that I'd like to touch upon or to, to mention is Greeks of the North who, due to the different religion they have, they uh, are called, uh, they believe to have a different nationality or ethnicity, which is not true. Um, they're not refugees, of course, they're not migrants, they're Greeks, but do they need our extra care? Oh, and attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a, this, this is a discussion that will be launched in, in, a follow, in a future event that will be organized in a different manner. Now, I'd like you to thank you, and I'd like to ask Mr. Papatheodoro now to, and Mrs. Kuduri to come forth because um, due to COVID, we can't be all together uh, this, and the panel together. It's a good thing that uh, we've managed to meet uh, in person today. This is uh, another threat to security. Unless we all, we're all vaccinated, things will become even worse. So, hello. Yet another great woman in her field. I have to say that when I sent the invitation to Mrs. Konduri, I didn't know her. I still don't know her, actually. Um, but I was impressed by her um, CV and her action. And I wanted us to have her here with us because I believe that we have to turn into brain gain. Um, Mrs. Pa Mr. Papa Theodoro is known to everyone. He is also part of the br brain gain that we have. Um, he's dealt with a lot of things, and he's done a lot of things, and he's very good at everything. But his recent uh, activities, he's also a good patriot, but of course, yes. 
What is the home country? What, what is your home country? Achaia, Northern Peripolis. Anybody else from uh, Achaia? There are a lot other Peloponnese in the room, but not from Achaia specifically. Laconia. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The minister is leaving the room. Right. So tomorrow is uh, the day, the, um, is the International Day for the Elimination of uh, Violence Against Women, and violence is an extraordinary threat to security. Now, this threat, along with others, must be managed, countered, um, I don't know, what is the term, Mr. Pathodoro? I suggest that we give the floor first to Mrs. Kuduri, and then gladly, I will pick up where Mr. Adilu will uh, leave off. We we can't hear he, okay. Is it a problem when, if all microphones are on? Okay, no. I believe that we should start with Ms. Koduri and then I'll pick up where she will leave off. Okay, Mrs. Koduri, she's going to focus on financial aspects. Actually, on sustainability. I'm for uh, how economy, society, and environment will interact in such a manner as to support our prosperity in life, our life and prosperity. So uh, can we also see the slides, please, because they're going to be helpful. Technicians, please. She was asked to do it herself, and she's asking how she can do it. Can I share my screen? How do I do it? Okay, good. So, okay, good. So, this is it. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to start with an overarching uh, position on our uh, on the concurrent crisis and their size. And you can see these waves, these tsunami waves. Of course, we've got uh, the pandemic, the economic. Uh, the ensuing economic crisis and the climate change, the increase in range of extreme weather phenomena as a result of the increase in the average temperature on the planet, and the biodiversity crisis or collapse uh, due to the collapse of the ecosystems where uh, we um, rely on which we, we rely for our uh, survival and the pandemic has shown that the planet is as resilient as the last country and person on the planet in other words any collapse can have a major impact on everyone. I am in charge of an international cluster for research on sustainability transition, joined mostly by the research institutes that I manage, uh, the University of Economics, uh, the uh, Athena Research Center, which is uh, the largest research center of the country uh, for research, uh, I, information technology research. I'm in, in charge of the stability unit there. And the, uh, the largest uh, partnership of uh, PPP, actually, in, in Europe that tries to uh, help the transition to economy of climate neutrality. I also manage the European and Greek hub of uh, the UN network for sustainability uh, for the purpose of communicating the technological and social solutions that can assist us um, 
to move towards um, sustainability, economic, environmental, and social sustainability. And uh, this is for the purpose of uh, politicians, policymakers, businesses, banks, financial institutions, as well as society, civil society at large. And this is why we are working on research programs, multiple programs, Horizon Europe ERC. We work on uh, innovation, acceleration, and of course, education, training, upskilling, reskilling. And we build a bridge between science and politics. And at this point, I'd like to give a brief and concise uh, description of what there is currently in place in order to have this threefold sustainability, that is economic, uh, society, social and environmental sustainability. And I'm going to talk about uh, recent policies that we are committed to um, implementing. Now, there are the sustainability target, um, the, the 17 ones. If we have a science-driven uh, framework in place, then 2030, we, in 2030, we will be in a good state uh, that where we will be using nature in such a manner as to support a robust economy and therefore social cohesion. We also have the Paris Agreement, which has to do with our effort to mitigate the increase in the temperature down to and keep it to a level that will allow us to survive, so plus two degrees. Then uh, in 2018, we've got the IPCC report, which is the key scientific report uh, telling us what uh, degrees, uh, where we could, up to what um, temperature we could withstand, given the technology we have, and that limits uh, the temperature increase uh, to 1.5 degrees. Now, in the, in the UNSDSN will present in York the six uh, transformers that will help us implement the SDGs. These have to do with education, health, energy, uh, decarbonization, sustainable use of the soil, water, and oceans, and the sustainable food production, sustainable cities and communities, as well as digital transition at the service of uh, digital of, of sustainable development. These are the transformations, the social and economic transformations that need to be achieved in order to be able to live say, with safety and security. Both genders, all people around the world. Regarding Europe, we have got the European Green Deal, a Green Deal that um, tries to achieve uh, climate neutrality by 2050, reduce pollution, protect people, and give leadership to clean technologies, clean technology businesses in Europe, and do all this without, uh, in, with inclusivity. Um, and social cohesion, this is supported with uh, one trillion, part of which will come from the European uh, part, and uh, the remainder will come from PPPs. In 2020, we have got, we had a COVID, uh, but even after this major non-linearity, we have uh, the European Development Strategy, the green, green and Digital Transition, this is a clear, made clear with Next Generation EU, the, the RR Fund F, which focuses on green investments and uh, digitization investments. 37% of these investments have to be in climate change and 20% digi in digitization. And along with this, uh, green and digital transition, 
We in 2021 we have got a lot of new laws and directives and uh, bills that um, are intended uh, to implement the, all this. In other words, the threefold that is reflected in the Greek deal and uh, in SG. Um, SGTs of the UN for the uh, Agenda 2030, uh, which is uh, environmental uh, resilience and uh, social cohesion and economic growth. We have got uh, the, the green gas uh, limit law in place, and very important because uh, the climate change costs a lot of human lives. And billion billions um, in terms of infrastructure disasters. We also have the EU taxonomy, which uh, tells us exactly. And actually, at this point, let me tell you the last week, we announced the Greek climate law, very important, because one of the first EU countries that uh, communicates is climate law, and I was uh, a member of the committee that um, elaborated uh, or drafted this uh, bill. We also have the EU taxonomy that tells us which uh, um, investments are resilient, green, and sustainable. And we've got the new directive that forces businesses to report on their corporate sustainability. Um, how their production supports sustainable actions. It is important to know that all this is taking place not only in Europe, but there's major momentum around the world currently. And this momentum needs to be turned into laws and policies, and in the case of Europe, so that we can move to sustainability by 2030 or in 2030 according to the UN Agenda 2030. All this in the framework of the Charter of Human Rights of the UN, i.e. Protect, human protection of people and human rights. For me, this is the political framework that determines the policies and the major implementation challenges. And this is a framework that needs to be implemented in a holistic manner. With this slide, I'd like to show you where we are and where we'll be in 2030 unless things change when it comes to certain targets. We've got certain targets, and you can see Greece here as well. I'll show you Greece individually later. Now, when it comes to peace, justice, and strong institutions. You see the map currently, left-hand side map is red, showing poor implementation, green showing indicating full implementation. So if we move on, if we continue like this, we won't have major implementation of these, uh, not even by 2030. Uh, orange shows major challenges, yellow shows progress, but uh, without achieving the implementation of the target, which is uh, green. This is gender equality. This is how the situation in terms of gender equality. You do realize we've got major issues in, uh, in Africa, Middle East, parts of Asia, and the situation is not going to uh, be considerably improved by 2030 if we continue like this. And this is climate change. Again, here we have got major challenges that uh, endanger the jeopardize rather uh, human security, safety and security, as well as the security of infrastructures, hence um, economic uh, prosperity. This is the situation in Greece currently. The United States Development Solutions Network prepares a report on all um, European countries, actually for all the countries of the world, but I'm responsible for the European countries, and you see that Greece has got a long way ahead of it. Of it. Um, and when it comes to education, which is a key pillar, 
that could change or transform a society and economy, as well as production, responsible consumption, production, and climate change. Progress has been achieved when it comes to SG1 regarding poverty, clean water, fresh water, clean energy, economic um, growth, but in other major areas such as climate action, life bill, water, which has to do with um, marine resources management, which is key to us, as well as the creation of establishment of partnerships, we are rather uh, we're in a stalemate. Now, coming from COP, I'd like to say that it's the first time ever that I feel uh, rather optimistic. I w was there most of my career. I've spent most of my career in the UK, Cambridge, LSE, and UCL. Um, but coming to Greece, I, I've brought people with me in the form of reversal of brain drain to work with us. Uh, but I've been pa taking part in corps, uh, and this is the first time that uh, I come back uh, quite optimistic because for the first time I see the businesses and financial institutions being really engaged in this transition. And why is this? Because technology has managed to give us renewable energy and circular economy, nature-based solutions, and digitization at a cost which is competitive in the current circumstances. And I believe that um, this is going to step up any uh, the transition and force politicians to move faster. There is large, a large shift. Uh, those who say that there was no progress in the Glasgow COP, they're simply ignoring what happened in the past. In, since 20. 15, we're plus four um, degrees Celsius after the Paris Agreement, and now, after the end of Glasgow, the pledges leave us with the hope that we will manage to contain the temperature rise to 1.8 degrees. Regarding the people that are uh, relocated uh, uh, due to the climate change, um, they're mostly women because they're most val more val vulnerable when it comes to climate change. Uh, as we, and I'd like to say that the U.S. committed itself in Glasgow to finance gender, uh, the gender action, uh, equality, gender, the gender equality action fund with 14 uh, billion per year. The four major conferences, UN conferences before the end of the year that will uh, put developments into motion um, are very important. And COP, UN food system, which uh, is about how we generate our, we produce our f food and how we manage it in order to feed all people, um, and G20, which in essence uh, are trying to see how developed economies can move to a development path that will not cause, that will not be self-destructive. In other words, it will have interact. It's a sensible interaction with nature, and, and res hence resolve the problem of global south. Because it's not enough for developed countries to do achieve the transition. We need to care about the developed world as well. The developing world, excuse me. The developing world lacks the technology and the fiscal space to achieve the transition. 
So we need to create the tools and funds so that uh, there is a transfer of know-how and support this with a technological transfer as well as upskilling and reskilling of people so the Global South can be part of the transition. And at this point, I'd like to say that upskilling and reskilling it's not only about the Global South, it's about developed countries as well. Because never before have people had such um, a fast rate of technological development. It's still a question whether our labor force can actually assimilate this technological development and use it. We need transition here. We need a transformation rather here, major investment in uh, upskilling and reskilling programs that um, will be sustainable. Because the technological development will never pause or stop. So our human resources need to partake in this technological development, and hence we need to constantly upskill and reskill them and have the best possible connection between universities, research centers, research centers, and the market. I will conclude by saying that apart from sustainable development report, we prepare the SDSN Europe report as well, showing how each EU member state can achieve the 2030 agenda and the European Green Deal so that we reach a uh, digital fu green digital future with positive multipliers and that will create jobs. And we link the SDGs to the Greek European Green Deal, the uh, half yearly procedure of the European Union that tells us what each country has to do every six months in order to reach the EU uh, macros average and how we should use the money of the funds of the RRF. I won't, I won't take any more of your time. I just want to tell you that you can read this report and see that first the European Green Deal is compatible with the SDGs, that the European uh, six-month uh, process is compatible with our uh, measurements of the SDGs implementation, that uh, technology is a catalyst for transition, that the transition has to be conceived in a holistic and systemic framework and not in a, fra in a fragmented manner or isolated manner. So the energy, land use, mobility systems have to be seen uh, together. And also we need to revise how, review how uh, we finance uh, and see whether we need uh, the states to intervene in order to ensure uh, long-term financing of innovation that is required in order for the trans necessary transformations to take place. And this is going to restructure uh, the f financial institutions, national macroeconomics, as well as the businesses that will have to understand that the most innovative ones will be the ones um, the ones that will survive. I will conclude by saying that this transition will create jobs, will, will also create vulnerable groups of uh, people. And these vulnerable groups of people can be protected by the revenues from climate, climate taxes and the uh, emissions trading system du duties. We've proved this by means of a very detailed uh, model And it is important to know that uh, given the right policies, we can increase the GDP, jobs, and 
equality in Europe. I apologize uh, for taking so much of your time. Well, I did identify some sort of uh, an optimism. We thought that we were going to be heading for the next 15 years. But uh, I see some sort of optimism in what you said. Maybe the threats became very, very tangible. Yes, the threats became tangible. And while this is very sad because, because uh, 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 as an academic, as a researcher, but as a person who works a lot on the science policy interface for the past 25 years, and we've been saying that for 25 years, for the past 25 years, climate change, etc. Nobody cared. Now, now that we see floods forest fires, and it's not only in Greece, everywhere in Europe, everywhere in the world. When we had the great fires uh, this summer in Greece, I uh, uh, log, uh, logged into NASA's fire locators and the whole world was on fire. Unfortunately, now we are experiencing it. Oh, it's a good thing that we are linking all this phenomenon with climate change, and this is exerting pressure on politicians to implement measures. So if you have pressure from civil society, if you have the technology that can offer the solution, a cheaper solution than fossil fuels, and if you have the financial institutions, uh, you know, following the same path, because that's where they see the opportunities for additional profit, then something can happen. Something can happen. Yes, that's it. Yes, it's something can happen. Yes, on the other hand, I was recently hearing that we should stop eating meat. Yes, about methane. Methane is the second most important GHG and a uh, hundred a hundred countries agreed during COP26 to reduce their methane emissions by 2030, almost to climate neutral levels, zero net levels. But the 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 point is to find the nutritional values of uh, meat in other technologies, and this technology is available, but we need to, to see how we're going to manage our livestock breeding. Yes, I, sp I talk a lot, I understand that. Yes, I, I like to hear you, but unfortunately, we need to speed things up a little bit. And now, talk about threats, other kinds of threats, yes, and risks. Thank you very much for your, for your invitation and visa last for this discussion. I will start with a challenge. The title of uh, this uh, conference we talk about inclusive security. Inclu and um, I need to say that in Greece there hasn't been a discussion on uh, inclusive security. It's not something you've heard of. It's not something that's been described. We speak in the same way as the dear colleague just said, this interface between science and policy, and science and politics, rather. But in the context we're examining today, the security policies, the inclusive, uh, inclusive security, inclusive crime-fighting security has not been the subject of any discussion in Greece, both on the part of the state and the institutions, so both from politics and from the institutions. Undoubtedly, today, it's uh, very innovative to be discussing of the inclusive society for an inclusive uh, rule of law, a rule of law that uh, concerns all people, all citizens, which protects rights. Protects rights because it is faced with new challenges and can respond to them. And in this direction, 
we uh, see the development of inclusive uh, policies that cover everybody. Habermas used to say that. Uh, I heard our colleague before, Ms. Kunduri, this inclusive society needs needs security policies, inclusive policies, concern the entire society. The society needs to see that this policy concerns it because it's important that the society forms part of uh, these policies, the civil society or the citizens themselves, and help create specific policies. What you know might might have been created theoretically uh, for many decades to, to to see it take the form of specific policies. So I would like to congratulate you because we haven't spoke we haven't spoken about inclusive security in the public debate in Greece, and we also haven't discussed what sort of security we want to date. I'm talking about public security. And of course, this does not mean the same for all of us. There is no social and political agreement on what security a country needs, what security a society needs that is faced with new risks, and a society that, apart from uh, risks, it is faced with new threats. So, I'll start by trying to clarify what inclusive security is. Security in itself is a challenge for a state, a, a challenge on the one part to safeguard goods, the, what the Constitution uh, defines as uh, the goods for each uh, uh, citizen, you know, property, health, life, in, uh, bodily uh, integrity, etc. And, and the other two to fulfill an obligation towards the citizens, which is not only the, the obligation to protect, but the, the social contest includes the obligation of the state to guarantee these goods for the citizens through the institutions, police, justice, etc., but are still uh, uh, not preventive, but repression uh, institutions, but also have preventive institutions in order to prevent threats to prevent risks and at the same time to also raise the interests of the citizens themselves, of municipalities, of regions, of those who work with civil society for engagement in the production of a common good. So there cannot be security unless it is a common public good. Otherwise, each one of us can procure private security services. But this is not something that concerns the society as a whole. This is private security. And nowadays, what's important is to agree that this obligation of the state to safeguard the goods and the rights of the citizens can be the the object of something that will be co-produced with society itself. Let me give you a very simple example so as not to uh, sound very generalistic. <coughs> Throughout Europe, there is a degree of uh, participation, of engagement of local communities, local governments, regional governments, NGOs in generation of public security. You've probably heard that in the United Kingdom there is a neighborhood watch. What's neighborhood watch? Is the participation of citizens in the better protection of the citizens themselves by taking up some actions for this security. And the key uh, institution that has undertaken security is a state, but it has a participation of the citizens who consider that they, this concerns uh, them as well. This does not only have to do with a, a central uh, policy choice, but with the public debate on whether citizens and bodies can participate in this generation of security. Schools can participate. Uh, education can participate in the production of security. NGOs obviously can uh, participate in this production. But how? 
through a specific action plan, which on the one hand is prepared by the state, and on the other hand, uh, uh, security is participative uh, security is a type of the co-production of a common public good. The anti-crime policy is something the 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 participating anti-crime policy has started 30 years ago in France. We are delayed by 30 years because nothing is, is delayed because of poor time management. It appears that our politicians No, rather, uh, politics, our politics would not desire such a, a scheme that exists in 20 out of 27 uh, EU member states. Which This means that this would establish the institutions that create this participation. Uh, local authorities participate with municipal police, not hybrid schemes, but public uh, municipal police, which, according to the various uh, conventions and agreements are in charge of handling uh, police matters at municipal level. And uh, crime councils uh, in, at local uh, level ha develop a relationship with the state and undertake the generation of part of this security. Why? Because there is a perception, a perception that this type of uh, security belong, does not belong only to the state but to society as a whole. And this has specific uh, characteristic, characteristics that have to do with something very important. For example, the polymorphy of uh, security strategies. One of that is the gender character of security. The gender based protection, namely the participation in, uh, in terms of uh, the participation of women, not only in the generation of security, but in the enjoyment of the end product, uh, women feeling more secure. Let me give you a counterexample. In the past 11 months, we have had 13 homicides with the victim with uh, women as victims, what the UN called femicide, with the term femicide. This does not mean that something went wrong. No, many things went wrong to have such a high rate of a specific crime. Something was very wrong. If we go back and try to see what went wrong, we'll, what we're going to see, we'll see that we, that violence prevention is not taught at school. It's one of the very few countries in Europe that is not happening. We'll see that our schools equ equality is not taught as part of the uh, education. It is start being a taught in the framework of skills uh, workshops. It's a good start, but it's a good start that comes very late in a country that has been a member of the EU in the past 40 years with policies uh, that have been included in the training, in the education process in the past 30 years in the EU. Formal forms of education, you know, bullying, prevention, uh, equality, processes, uh, procedures that have to do with uh, the prevention of violence. And we also uh, live uh, in a country where you've heard earlier that we have a problem. We know that we have a problem of uh, abused children. What are the state structures that exist that will help these children, the abused children? Uh, maybe the state has assigned, delegated this task to an NGO, the smile of the child, but the state itself does not have a policy to prevent such forms of violence. If today an abused woman, if it goes to the police, 
If she goes to the police, uh, is she going to uh, be able to speak to a psychologist to receive support? Is she going to get immediate help, psychological help, social help, financial help, so that she doesn't have to go back home where she is a victim of abuse? If we wonder why these structures are not there, we'll see why we don't talk about participative uh, security in Greece. Now, let's not go f very far away from Cyprus to Spain. Spain has a support program once there is a complaint. Irrespective of whether the complaint is, is, uh, has grounds or not, this is up to the, the, the judicial to, to discover. So if there is a complaint for a case of abuse, there is the possibility for that person to be removed from the abusive environment. Protection of the children taken with her, uh, the, the, if the, the, that person can, can, can go to a house for as long as the case is active. We see there that the participative security, the possibility of preventing risks and threats vis-à-vis -vis what we call gender-based violence, is not just a discussion between specialists. There is a state policy, uh, there is a social policy that with with the support of the civil society and with the support of NGOs, with the support of uh, local governments or specialized bodies. All these work together in uh, work together in partnership, in tandem. And when we see this partnership, there is also there are also specific roles that are undertaken taken from the various partners of this endeavor. I don't want to tire you a lot, but I just want to say that this participative safety, security, security today, we, we described it, it is a common public good that belongs to everyone. It's not just obligation of the state. It is obligation on the parts of the citizens to, part, to participate in the joint generation of this good of sec security. But we see that there are new risks and new threats. I'm just going to mention but a few in order to make a bridge with security. New threats and uh, new risks in the past uh, 20, 25 years are added to what we call addressing uh, public security problems in society. The new, the new challenges, in other words. Some of them are very well known. Uh, Sofia Vultepsi spoke of radicalization. Radicalization in the past 10 years is among the, the main causes of risk in Western societies where both the European strategy for the anti-crime policy that exists for the past five years and the national policies have to address these new risks, which are they have specific characteristics. Uh, they are unpredictable, incomprehensible. Uh, they have a footprint which can never be calculated or measured by the forces uh, that are dealing with these risks. Nobody could possibly consider the decapitation of a professor in France. Nobody 20 years ago could possibly think of the Twin Towers. Nobody could possibly imagine the Bataclan uh, attack in France, the blind terrorist attacks in railway stations and airports everywhere across Europe in the past 20 years. But the discussion, the debate on how to address this risk uh, reached the point of discussing, especially after ISIS and the Arab Spring, to, uh, we found ourselves in a position to, to discuss radicalization, which is uh, inherent within the European societies. In, this, in the European societies, we have problems of uh, integration of population groups which uh, create conditions of threat for democracy through the societies where they they were born and they went to schools. Most perpetrators were not 
did not come from abroad. Most perpetrators are Europe's children. They were children that were born in Europe and went to school in Europe, uh, because they're children of, uh, of ghettos in Europe. And children who, through religion, through uh, fundam fundamentalist action, lead to such mass murders. So radicalization is part of the risk. Europe calls it a new serious threat. So it's included not in risks. Uh, we're not now using it the society of risk. Or, or, uh, now this links us with the analysis of Ms. Gunduri. We live in the society of damage. We've gone beyond the risk. The risk has materialized. It has caused damage. It has caused a fault to society. And as long as we don't see that uh, we need to address this issue in a different style, in different mode, in this uh, uh, inclusive society, which may start from uh, citizenship and uh, uh, up to how do we encourage political participation. We can't have a soci uh, society without political society. All this discussion of uh, integration at Sofia's port. So we do not live in a society of traditional or conventional crime and address the risk in the same way we've learned to address in the past years, past decades. Now we live in a society of cybercrime. Cybercrime right now uh, takes up completely different forms. And it's completely different forms which are so opaque and dark that can manipulate society. You know, a fake news attack has shaped the conditions, has created the condition of some belief to create an imbalance in the UK referendum on the breakfast. A, 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 major political events. Such forms, we know that such forms have existed in referenda. We know that they might have affected elections of superpowers. We know that today can shape conditions of the dissemination of panic and new forms of crime where we need AI, the fourth technological revolution. Why? Because an element of security is that the technology of uh, addressing crime should precede the technology of crime. So far, it's the opposite. The crime is ahead in terms of technology to the uh, technology available to address this crime. And this trend should be reversed. I would like to uh, complete saying this, new risks require us to have a holistic approach. What does this mean? It means that we must all agree for traditional uh, crime from juvenile delinquents to organized crime, agree that there are 10 or 20 ways of addressing this type of security challenges, again, not each one by themselves because the European countries together because if risks come from sometimes risks come from many countries so organized crime is not a national crime so this requires the assistance and the partnership of many states but we need to take a look at some other issues as well to see how ecology crime ecology crimes namely crimes that have to do the quality of life of citizens based on the ecosystem where they live and the respect of the rules for protection of the environment. Again, we can find common ground here. Eco crime right now is one of the greatest threats for the security of citizens. If if citizen security is considered a right for all of us, it's considered a right because it is aligned with the certainty, the security of everyday life, and the quality of life. In downgraded environments, uh, there is no security. So there is uh, 
lower level of quality of life and therefore there read from the from the Chicago school we'll, we'll be discussing that that uh, participation in the production of public security it's a matter of quality of life and a matter of governance and this with this I would like to conclude governance is what sets and should set the tone the prospect the strategy for addressing security problems that's what we are lacking and that's why there's no dialogue maybe we're discussing about the capabilities of uh, police we have the the greatest police force per 100,000 residents in Europe but that's not the point the point is that the the strategy in the framework of public security uh, or whether the strategy is beneficial for the citizens and how participative it is so that citizens should be interested. So there's a long way to go uh, on this in Greece and it's good to start instead of just discussing it since it is one of the key points, the key points of politics today, yesterday, but I'm afraid tomorrow. Thank you very much. I confess that you raised a lot of uh, aspects. I would like to raise an objection in the sense that government and governance, according to what I believe, are not separate or isolated from citizens. It's the representatives of the citizens. So has to be an immediate relation between uh, governments and citizens. There are a lot of things that also I would like to comment on, like how we teach equality or uh, violence at school. Equality is not something to teach. It is inherent. An equally inherent uh, right is for a person to feel secu safe and secure. Nobody has to needs to provide this to anybody. A lot of issues. We were going to discuss this uh, again shortly because there has to be some interaction with society. Thank you very much, both of you. Now I pass the floor to, let me say something, the speech of Mr. Papa Theodoro should be shared with the Secretary General of uh, NATO because in uh, the, the summit two years ago, inclusive security was first launched. And those who had uh, studied these issues or who dealt with these issues were uh, were taken aback. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Feduli, who is here, comments off the microphone. Yes, both were are uh, defining a new the, the the future. So, a discussion is being initiated within the uh, alliance, which is very important. I really enjoyed your speeches. Okay, Mrs. Kadziani now. Mrs. Kadziani will now be the moderator. So, Mrs. Kadziani, is uh, very very aware of these issues because she's been with us for many many years since a very young age. And she's trying to convey messages from students, coming from students and her daughter. Thank you. 
So, Mrs. Bura will have to come to the floor. Two iron ladies will be at the panel. Is Mr. Kostakos online? Mrs. Hart, is she online? Hello on my part. First of all, my name is uh, Elia Hadzigiani. I'm associate professor uh, at the University of uh, Peloponnese. Our university is also represented by Mr. Patheodoru, so male and female representation, because we as a university believe that there has to be collaboration and uh, collaboration between men and women. I'd also like to thank Mrs. Mitsaku, Mr. Georgiou, once again, for having invited me once again and be part of this um, powerful group, powerful team, rather, the powerful team of uh, um, WIS. And I'll start moderating this panel with two sh short uh, remarks. First of all, inclusive security means that not that, that we're all actively involved, both men and women, whether we come from the civil society or the government or international universities or NGOs. Security is about involvement and action, less or more action, but action. And security and involvement start at school, or the years of education, uh, but also they start in the family. Respect for human beings, Respect for fellow people, fellow human beings. Everybody starts at the family and then enhanced through education. So involvement is about representation, action, and respect for fellow human beings. Um, without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to the first speaker of our panel, Mr. Kostakos, who is a co-founder and executive director of the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability in uh, Brussels, and uh, co-director of the Greek Forum for Sustainable Development, very experienced and capable with uh, significant action. Mr. Kostakos, you have the floor and welcome. Thank you, Mrs. Kaziani. I see Mrs. Siregela wants to leave and I don't know, perhaps you should uh, give her the floor first. Because she looks as if she's about as if she's about to leave because I'm going to be here and stay. Is Mrs. Siregela online? Yes, I'm here. 
I've joined and I've been uh, watching you, but because uh, tomorrow is the international um, day for elimination of violence against women, I've got a very busy day tomorrow, then I need to leave. Okay, fine. So we give the floor to Mrs. Sirigella. Uh, uh, who is Deputy Minister of Labour and Social uh, protec Protection, responsible for the demography and family policy. Thank you, Ms. Hadziyani. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Kostakos for uh, giving me his place. I'll try and be very brief. I'd like to first of all thank uh, Mrs. Mitsako, the President, for inviting me here today and giving me this opportunity to be with you. First of all, I'd like to say that every as every time, but uh, on the occasion of tomorrow's uh, day, National Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, I'd like to say that this is an issue that uh, concerns us all. As you said, Ms. Kaziani, everything starts at school and uh, the family, and it's not a battle between the sexes, the genders. We want men with us. We're talking about human rights. Women's rights are human rights, and we want um, men on our side in this, in this battle. Of course, it's a society that needs to be aware. Um, we shouldn't tolerate any form of violence. And be I heard earlier that there are no structures. Of course, there are structures. There are, and these structures have been supported by all governments because. There should be no ideology involved in these issues. The uh, PASOK New Democracy uh, governments in, in 2013, uh, first uh, counseling centers opened uh, in back in 2011, offering counseling, psychological support to women uh, victims of violence, as well as social support, and parental support as well. We have... Um, established uh, collaboration with local bar, uh, bars and uh, there's also work support, labor support, because a lot of uh, women who, who are victims of violence were also jobless and this made it worse, made it more difficult for them to leave this abusive, their abusive environment, especially when they had minor children. There are 19 um, hostels uh, for these women. There's a f hotline 24-7 uh, which can deliver immediate help and counseling as well as support to women who are victims of violence as well as uh, the third persons. And also we're at disposal of everyone who wishes to provide such help. And uh, in uh, recent times, because, uh, recently rather, because they have, there shouldn't be any ideological differences in these issues and we should all join forces together, local government, private sector, NGOs, uh, civil society organizations, not because of the Constantinople Treaty alone, which is also a law of this country, but because this is how it should be, as this is the only way that we can achieve more. In uh, the forthcoming period, we're going to present a new action plan on uh, gender equality that uh, talks about uh, sustainable development, uh, equality, women uh, free from uh, stereotypes, and uh, the gender mainstreaming in national policies. This action plan was uh, adopted by the cabinet, and now every ministry has got specific actions and uh, programs that needs to implement based on the specific actions that are identified, uh, defined by us, the Ministry of Labor and the Secretary, Gen the Secretary General. And for this time ever, there is a specific uh, business plan, uh, this, uh, excuse me, operational plan that uh, has been shared with the um, uh, Economic Experts Council, and there is also a visibility study regarding the potential uh, development that will be driven, or growth that will be driven by this action plan. This is very important uh, um, for our national policy and all of the women that uh, live in our country, be it um, 
uh, Greek citizens uh, or refugees or uh, or migrants. We're also in collaboration with international European organizations, you know, to promote the intercultural development and the enhancement of uh, tolerance and mutual understanding. And we need to um, build a front of uh, resistance towards acts and actions that endanger the self-determination, freedom, and security of women. Um, right. Right now, in the skill workshops at, uh, at schools, um, there's a workshop regarding um, gender equality, sexual education, respect for diversity as well. I am not going to describe our, our initiatives in detail because I don't want to um, take more of the time more time than uh, I'm, allow I'm allotted uh, but I would love to talk about uh, the equal and balanced uh, representation of women in uh, the bodies that uh, make decisions, decision-making bodies, as well as, uh, as a safety valve. We need to start a systematic uh, uh, nurturing of uh, female leadership for reasons of effectiveness and efficiency, amongst others. In conclusion, I'd like to also say that the pandemic has brought about a lot of difficulties and has left behind a lot of victims around the world, but it has caused it has led to one advantage, one benefit. Uh, societies came closer, exchanged um, views, shared experience, and it's an excellent opportunity in this current juncture to lay new foundation, and it is uh, definite that um, our efforts will be fruitful. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Regela, Mr. Papatheodor would like to ask a question. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you fine. Mr. Papatheodor, you have the floor. We have come across Ms. Regela and her work. I know she's doing great work. We agree on many things. There is no ideological base whatsoever in the in the presentation of the reality when there is a social issue such uh, s s s such a great social issue so to to avoid any any misunderstanding what i said earlier and i agree with you is that in a country that's been a member of the european union for 40 years the delay, the slow maturity of policies in Greece, or policies that Greece attempts to implement, has brought about a greater exposure to risk, because indeed it's a very good thing that's going to be an operational plan for the first time. As you said, we both know that in most European countries, this is an ongoing operation program of all governments in time. Obviously, nobody, and myself first of all, does not uh, underestimate the uh, intervention of KC all these years, nor the creation of the available structures, but we should agree that in Greece we were very late in identifying the problem and in generating policies suitable to that would favor prevention obviously there's still a lot to be done so but when we compare uh, to com to conclude when we compare the situation of our country at an institutional level with other countries we realize we and we see the the differences, the deviations, and the lack of a holistic strategy. Like I said, I spoke earlier of police stations. I participated in the education of uh, judges for combating sexual harassment. Many colleagues participate in the training of uh, police officers. The question is this. 
Our police stations, in order to be in a position to offer primary interventions, will they have such uh, structures that will actually support abused women, abused children, and this being a part of the of, of the function of the operation? And I obviously, that's what I said earlier, and I agree that things have been done. Uh, uh, and I have recorded that in both my political and scientific capacity that there's a lot to be done in order to raise society's awareness so that the structures will be in a position to produce security both for women and the vulnerable populations. Thank you very much. Just, uh, just a small, uh, but as I understand, and for this reason, I wanted to clarify certain things as regard the available structures because uh, truly, uh, whenever I can and I give a press conference, I want to convey this message that, uh, that uh, as I said, that this is uh, this has gone through all, all the governments, and that's why I don't want to have a political controversy on this issue because there's so many other things that divide us, but there are many things that can bring all, all the political sides together. Uh, surely you are right, uh, but yes, and we were very late. I'm not trying to say that in the past two years I've been in this position, everything is perfect and you know everything, the situation has, uh, is considerably better in Greece and we've reached the levels of Sweden or of Finland. But some things, we've started implementing something, we started doing things, you know, and there are some steps taken and positive steps. And as I said, and as you said, we should all be together, uh, join together and try together. Of course, we should identify what is wrong. And, and criticism is very welcome when it's done in good faith. And the action plan was in consultation for uh, quite some time, and the positive, uh, the good comments raised during the consultation, we included them in the national action plan. No matter where these comments came from, we, uh, what we're trying to do is find good examples and try to adapt our own policy for this. Uh, in any case, uh, some first steps have been taken, and I don't think we should have ideological differences on this, and uh, we should work together. Uh, just allow me to, to contribute to this discussion, which, uh, dear Minister and Professor, concerns you. I'm just going to say something as a, as a, as a teacher, and as a private individual, and as a parent that I am surprised that uh, in 2021, and it's something that concerns me and scares me, that in 2021, in a discussion for global uh, governance, we are discussing, we are discussing uh, gender equality and the protection of women. So it, it saddens me that in our country, the security of women is combined and is considered as a direct uh, condition or is, is linked directly with global governance. That I need to constantly remind my, my students, uh, women students, that be careful, be careful when you're out there, and I'll never forget that you're women, there are special conditions. That's what I, I want to say. It's not a criticism, and just uh, add a comment. Thank you, thank you, Minister, for your participation and for everything you do. If I could say one thing. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Serengela. But you shouldn't tell your students to be careful because you're women. This is uh, defeatism. The big, uh, be careful of the bad guys. You know, if uh, the bad guys could be women. Okay, thank you. We'll, st we'll continue with Mr. Kostakos. Mr. Kostakos, are you still there? Yes, I'd like to show you a PowerPoint presentation. I'll share my screen. 
I was glad to hear this um, interpartisan uh, continuum, which is very important to have in our country as well, because these institutions should be persistent and uh, remain despite any changes in uh, the uh, political parties in, uh, in office. Now, please, I'd like to share my screen now. If you could please allow me to screen my share to, to share my screen. I'd like to thank you very much for this invitation, first of all. I'd like to thank Wies actually for this invitation. I think the previous speaker has managed to share the screen. Ah, okay, now I can. Now I can. Thank you. I hope you can see. Can you see my screen? All right, so please tell me that you can confirm that you can hear and see. Yes, yes, we can. Um, I'll talk about uh, some, the, I'll give you my point of view of the issues that have been uh, discussed at the foundation of, um, I've, I've worked uh, in, uh, in various capacities in Paris, I was in Paris in 2015 in uh, the UN Secretariat for Climate Change. I've got a lot of experience that um, I, uh, and I'd like to share my experience here within this context. So this is the institutional frame for the countering of global threats of non-military non threats based on uh, human resilience. We talked about the type of threats that we are dealing with, which are multidimensional and interdependent. Um, this is a list where we have got uh, environment on top environmental and uh, bottom social uh, threats and uh, we have to say that climate uh, crisis and biodiversity are um, interdependent and uh, affect each other the the biodiversity issues are critical especially when uh, because we destroy other living uh, bodies in as human beings which leads to um, the worsening situation we have got uh, drought pandemics um, famine uh, acute aggravation of um, inequalities there's also digital chaos digital anarchy there is a lack of order uh, in the on the internet uh, where we spend most of our time especially young people who become prone to living in the digital rather than the physical world and uh, they're influenced by facebook and the algorithms that uh, seek to increase the profit of uh, the advertisers and so i show the interaction and independence um, between the threats, and I'd like to talk to you about the multidimensional uh, threats. There's the climate climate crisis, not just an environmental crisis. It, it, it is related with economy, how economy is organized uh, from production, energy production to consumption, product produ production, uh, excuse me, production, then consumption, um, the extraction of uh, raw materials, and how we've organized our society to be a society of, an aband of abundance. We believe uh, we don't see the limits. We think that everything is limitless. Uh, we've made a lot of mistakes so far, especially developed countries, and uh, this is where we belong. We belong to the developed uh, world. And then governance is a key issue indeed, because um, all bodies, private, public, civil societies, should have understood what is going on and do something about it. It's never too late, of course, but for all other climate crises, for all crises, there are these dimensions. This, uh, we live in the 
era of the Anthropocene. This is the geological period that we're currently living. And um, one made effects on the environment, the impacts on the environment uh, are huge, and we have exceeded some critical limits, and you must be aware uh, the, don the donut economics of Kate uh, Rowworth, which gives us a ceiling of how far we can reach because of the planet boundaries, given the climate change, the oceans, the, the, the ocean acidification, the ocean depletion, fertilizers, and the thresholds, the social threshold, which prevents us from going any lower because uh, then the social security and peace will be upset and will be led to inequalities, gender and other inequalities. So we need to reside within this uh, the green zone of the green uh, of the of the uh, donut economics. Uh, we have already entered the pink and white uh, areas, of course, and we have to keep this in mind when we are preparing for this era of uh, polycrisia, as I've called it in uh, some articles of mine. And we've actually entered this era of polycrisia. Now, the framework of management, the current um, institutional framework of management is uh, uh, cannot is not sufficient is not adequate to deal with the challenges and the threats with the national level we've got the UN with um, specialized organizations but uh, they uh, tackle with their uh, scope in a silo um, a silo ma uh, manner they see them in, a, in isolation from each other and this cannot continue because as we've already had from Ms. Koduri and other speakers that the economy, investments, the industry, everyone has to consent and uh, make major changes in the way that uh, they operate in order to resolve the problem. But in Glasgow, they couldn't uh, negotiate these issues. There were some declarations published, but there's been no specific uh, framework to give solution to these problems, nor is there any mechanism for the, the pandemic, for instance. We say that this is a medical issue, but is it indeed? Because uh, the pandemic has led to economic crisis due to the lockdown, then social crisis, violence, family violence, because when people uh, are um, isolated in their homes, they become violent, and we see that all this has proven that the current institutional framework is not adequate because of this silo phenomenon, because one organization works in isolation from all the others. The same is true for the, the European and uh, Greek uh, levels as well. We have got uh, the various portfolios of the commissioners in the uh, European Commission and uh, the, the portfolios of ministers in the government, national governments that are not uh, interactive. Um, and then we have the UNCC, the uh, Framework Agreement for Climate Change. There we have got um, they deal with the climate change, but not all the other issues that are closely related with this, such as how the, the, there are numerous examples showing how isolated organizations cannot be effective and efficient. We have got so many international actors that have become uh, that are very strong, like the G20. Uh, we have got the European Union, the cities large multinationals, we've got um, uh, the web companies, uh, the financial institutions, they're all powerful, but they fail to assume responsibility. They tend to forget their duties, especially when there are no governments making sure that all this is implemented. Now, how will we manage to respond dynamically and effectively? We need a better coordinated effort among us all uh, institutions and society at large is what we call the whole of government or whole of society approach. We need um, unifying um, narratives. 
that will um, guide us to a common vision and uh, understand that we have called the Agenda 2030 of the UN with the 17 SDGs, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, at the European level we have called the European Green Deal, the uh, just transition in the post-carbon era, protecting biodiversity. We have got uh, um, higher personal involvement of uh, state, uh, heads of governments and states, which is a positive message. And we have innovations such as the Ministry of Climate uh, Crisis and uh, Civil Protection. I hope we will have the chance to listen to Mr. Stenny this later. We'll see how this is going to work, whether it's going to become inter-ministerial somehow, bringing along the other ministers, or whether it's going to be operate in a silo, uh, dealing with its own, managing its own uh, budget, as it happens in the case of the Ministry of Ener Environment and uh, Energy that has been responsible for this agenda so far. Now, uh, the action and uh, the targets, um, uh, well, um, nothing can happen in isolation. It's uh, always a matter of win-win uh, approach. I don't know, of course, in the long run how this can work, but there are a few things uh, that uh, should be done and others that shouldn't. So, based on my personal experience, I see that individual level, the, this, the goal is uh, well-being, not prosperity, but well-being. Um, so that others can live well as well. Well, uh, then the social society, the goal is the resilience, in other words, be able to respond to crisis as a society. So, um, for instance, we shouldn't import food from uh, distant, uh, the need to, tra to travel a long way to get to us. And then we have got the nature and future generations. Uh, there we have got sustainability. Um, we need to care for the future generations and as well as ourselves in future years. And for everyone and everything, the key principles are inclusiveness, uh, solidarity, equality, and justice that might need idealized, but uh, they do work for humanity. And I'll give two examples now, concluding, sticking to the time to the time allotted to me. So two examples of what we have found out in uh, our institution. This slide is is in English, unfortunately, not in Greek. So I will try and translate this into Greek, says the speaker regarding uh, militaries for civil emergencies or civilian emergencies. There are a lot of positive elements, uh, like uh, last summer, uh, where we asked the, uh, of the armed forces to help in uh, the uh, in putting out wildfires. This is the case with NATO as well. NATO. We submitted a report to the Secretary General showing how these mechanisms uh, can not just do this ad hoc or in call, but to be part of their duties with expert and specialized staff like engineers and medics. We had uh, the military medics uh, helping immensely in vaccination procedures. Uh, also, other specialized units in Greece, we've got uh, the special um, engineering uh, unit uh, 747, which uh, is specialized in natural disasters. Uh, the army around the world has got logistical capacity when it comes to the transport of um, food, for instance, water or anything else that is required. And of course, also a significant budget because uh, there is, uh, of course, the key duty of security, but uh, there is some resources, some funds should be 
uh, earmarked for uh, the for civil emergencies, and um, of course, not always, uh, not everything is positive. There is a legal framework that raises um, obstacles quite often. Of course, this can change. In Greece, armies among the institutions that is highly, that are highly appreciated by uh, people. We have to see how policies or political political authorities that are responsible to do for these disasters uh, interact with the military forces. And we, of course, have the international cooperation with international organizations, UN, EU, NATO, taking part in um, uh, drills and trainings. And uh, now, a new UN Security Council. This is a uh, work in progress. This is work in progress for tackling non-military threats to human uh, security. What is uh, going to be set up is a Global Resilience Council, which will, as you may see here, uh, suppose we have caught a threat, which is not a military threat, and, and we have got the Security Council for non-military issues. So the Security Council so there is a body in place, then there's a, uh, the Security Council, the General Assembly, and let's say they see that this is uh, multidimensional or that it concerns a lot of organizations that cannot just be resolved by one. So this is taken to this uh, Resilience Council, the Global Resilience Council, which is here uh, in the middle, but it is surrounded or framed by uh, representatives of uh, representatives it is uh, surrounded by various organizations, women's organizations, youth organizations, um, NGOs, uh, which help in the negotiation and resolution of such issues such as the pandemic or the healthcare crisis. And then it, decisions are made and implemented because every citizen on this planet needs to assume responsibility and to be actively involved in the resolution of these problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Kostakos. Your proposal for a Global Resilience Council is quite interesting. Do you think there is there's a possibility for this to become a reality? Well, as always, when we start such a, de, de, such a negotiation, we are making a proposal and there are going to be changes, of course. And we haven't, that's why we haven't identified it precisely to see who's going to be a member or not, whether it's going to be permanent or not. There is, uh, there is a, a report and uh, there's another proposal now, a similar proposal, so by presenting our own proposals by redefining some of the proposals and we already have very we've seen very good reactions from various countries and the Global Challenges Foundation of Sweden and we continue and I think that with the help of all I believe that Greece and all of us who uh, are listening to us today will be positive in this direction and so that you and all academics will help us in this direction as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we wish you the very best of success. Thank you very much. Uh, I do believe in global governance, and uh, we apologize for uh, the, this delay. Now, moving on. This is Alison Hart, uh, who is the acting NATO Special Representative for Women, Peace, and Security, and head of the Human Security Unit in the Office of the NATO Secretary General. Uh, Mrs. Hart, are you here? Can you hear us? I am. Thank you very much. Welcome. I hope you can hear me well. We can hear you. We can't see you yet. Uh, we Wait. can't see you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, good evening to you all. It's a real pleasure there to join you. you for this symposium on inclusive security. Um, I want to just send a warm thanks to Dr. Mitsakos for the invitation to Wise Hellas, the Greek Association for Atlantic and European Cooperation, 
everybody involved in organizing today's discussion. I think it's a really important set of topics and I'm glad to be able to contribute. Now, we know that there are many challenges to our security. We've talked through many of these already. Of course, they're not only traditional threats of armed attack, but also threats to our livelihoods and societies, including those from disinformation, climate change, and other challenges that we've already addressed. Now, NATO's role is to help safeguard the freedom and security of all of its members. That's representing nearly 1 billion people. Now, we know that we need to understand the threats to our security, wherever they might come from, and we need to prepare to address them together. Our NATO 2030 agenda that Ms. Afantuli discussed in the very beginning, this is helping NATO to chart the course uh, in how to deal with these challenges. But we also know that people see and experience the world in different ways. And it is therefore vital that we challenge our assumptions when we think about how we approach our peace and security. So I'd like to talk with you today about NATO's work on women, peace and security, and how this supports all of our efforts to advance peace and security today and also into the future. Now, the first proposal I'd like to make is that the women, peace and security agenda is fundamentally about understanding that some of the assumptions that had been made about peace and security over the years were wrong. And the agenda is also about making a concerted effort to course correct so that our efforts to build peace and security are both more effective and more sustainable. So what are some of these mistaken assumptions? Well, it used to be assumed, and perhaps sometimes still is in some places, that security was basically the same for everyone. And that if we understood the impact of something on one part of the population, probably the men, then we understood enough to go ahead with our plans. It was also assumed that men were most likely to have the information that we might need to make good decisions. Of course, we now know that this does not hold. We understand that how security is perceived and experienced can differ dramatically depending on whether someone is a man or a woman. Now, of course, there are other factors that come to bear, age, economic status, others, but gender often makes a really dramatic difference. And this matters not only because of the experience of women, as important as that is, but because it can and often does make the difference between success and failure of any given initiative. I'll offer an example. Imagine that you're working to stabilize and reconstruct a village that's trying to emerge from conflict. They need access to water, so you build a well. No one is using the well. It turns out that the walk to the well is dangerous for women and that the trip exposes them to violence or abduction. Now, men walk that way all the time, so it didn't occur to you that it wasn't a good spot. But now that the well is not in use, disease is on the rise, and that hard-won piece is quickly crumbling. This is one example. There are countless others. So part of our course correction relates to how we assess the potential impact of our plans and with whom we engage on the ground. Now, what other assumptions do we need to challenge? It was long assumed that the business of peace and security was for men. And of course, we saw this, we saw men doing this work, both in the political and military realms throughout history. And for the most part, it was also assumed that women were not fit to serve or to lead. We now know that this was very wrong too. Clearly, women are just as capable of leading a country or a company. Now, course correcting on this point though requires far more than allowing women to join the armed forces or the diplomatic corps. It means more than letting women run corporations or run for public office. It requires that we look at our structures and the tools that we use through a new lens and that lens has to take diversity into account. Consider the equipment used by those in our armed forces. I'll take a very simple example. Body armor is often designed for the standard soldier and the standard soldier is a man. He's probably also a man from a particular background in a particular region. But this doesn't always provide adequate protection for those outside that standard. Both women and men have highlighted numerous issues with equipment fitting and safety. 
and many of the NATO militaries are working at overcoming these challenges. I'll mention a more recent problem, automated systems that do not consider the differences in voices, languages, and accents in communication systems filter out key parts of communication. Many such systems are trained with data that is not representative of potential users. Women's voices typically have a higher frequency than men's. Different language groups speak with different rhythms, have different structures, and even if two groups speak the same language, their logical and emotional use of the language is different. So in human machine interaction, this oversight could lead to unintended incidents. Such types of machine learning and artificial intelligence run real risks of further amplifying issues through biased data and learning. Now, these are just two examples that apply to one facet of NATO's work. The implications are far broader, but the key here is to recognize that if we're not taking gender into account, if we're not taking an inclusive approach, we are putting our people at risk and we're compromising our own effectiveness. Let me come back to where I started. The Women, Peace and Security agenda is fundamentally about understanding that some of the assumptions made about peace and security over the years were wrong and making a concerted effort to course correct. Now, pursuing policies and programs that incorporate gender equality is truly a powerful tool in driving that course correction and ultimately in supporting more sustainable, peaceful, stable and free societies. This is the work that NATO is doing now, integrating gender into all that we do. We know that when women are included and when we understand the power of their agency, we all benefit. But if we don't keep this in focus, we won't be as effective as we might hope. We also understand, of course, that the security environment is dynamic. Much of what we've talked about today are some of the less traditional threats that we have to address. Gender perspectives are key to understanding these new and emerging challenges and key to addressing them successfully. That includes issues like cybersecurity and new technology. I already mentioned the problem of bias systems that are weak or fail because they were developed in a diversity vacuum. Technology can and does perpetuate inequalities in society. And we're beginning to understand some of the ways in which this has an impact. Another area on which NATO is focused is climate change. We've talked a lot about this already today. In developing areas, when women are forced from their homes, they're at risk of being trafficked or sexually abused. Droughts put women at risk of sexual violence when they have to go farther from home to find water. But of course, women can also play an important positive role in combating climate change. Studies show that they are more likely to be engaged in sustainable resource management. NATO leaders recently agreed an agenda on climate and security, including a recognition that the gendered aspects of this challenge must be taken into account. Terrorism is yet another area where women are sometimes victims, sometimes perpetrators. They play roles in their communities that can help or harm. So we cannot ignore the gendered aspects of terrorism if we hope to get this right. And NATO too, in our action plan on counterterrorism, has incorporated gender in a variety of ways. And on resilience, which is a priority for NATO, and I know one of the focuses of today's symposium, we know that we are only as strong as the ability of each country and each community to rebound from setbacks. So at NATO, we look at infrastructure and what vulnerabilities there might be. We look at the capacity of our medical facilities to deal with significant overload. We look at the communication systems that we use to ensure a reliable flow of information. In all of this, it is vital to take into account that our societies and all of these services involve both women and men. Our healthcare systems, for example, are staffed primarily by women, upwards of 70%, in some places even higher. If we want to rely on a strong healthcare system, we need to keep in mind who it is that is serving and, and holding that system up. 
Many of those women who are working in healthcare might have children at home. They might be the primary caregivers for those children. So we need to take into account the impact of closing schools on the ability of our healthcare workers to perform their roles. It's just one example, but if we're not asking the question, we're taking on more risk than we realize. So all in all, whether we're talking about the security impacts of climate change, emerging and disruptive technologies, terrorism, and more, while we know that the dynamics vary from one place to another, we also know that in any given circumstance, men and women may be impacted differently. So security is best served by considering what these differences might mean. The bottom line is that in order to truly deliver peace and security, whether through NATO, through national or local authorities, through civil society, we need to challenge our assumptions and take a truly inclusive approach. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Hart. Thank you for uh, explaining to us uh, a NATO strategy and uh, how important it is for the alliance uh, gender equality and how it tends to promote gender equality. Uh, any questions for Mrs. Hart? Aliki? Not a question, really, but uh, I just wanted to um, contribute a little bit because it is very, very important. Like we said before, sorry, as we said earlier, NATO has been the key security provider, at least for Europe and the U.S. Of course, the other countries too, but it was the key security organization, and it's very important that this key security providing security organization, which has been um, mostly military, opens up to human beings, and uh, inclusive security, giving the necessary priority to including everyone, regardless of gender, and uh, set the conditions for sustainable development. Feedback, and uh, it makes us a little bit more optimistic for the future. A lot more, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. to ask uh, Dr. Eftimiopoulos uh, to contribute uh, to our meeting. Dr. Eftimiopoulos, Marius, is a dear colleague. He, he, he's, he said he, uh, he's an associate professor of international security and strategy uh, at the American University of, uh, in Dubai. Uh, he's done uh, many, many things. Among others, he's the dean of uh, the School of International Secu Security and uh, Global uh, Policy. Kyrie Ephthimiopoulos, welcome. Mr. Ephthimiopoulos, welcome. No sound. There is no sound from Mr. Ephthimiopoulos. Good evening, first of all, from the Emirates. Thank you very much. It's been a long time since I last saw you. I hope you're all well. I would like to thank Mrs. Mitsako and Mr. Georgiou, as well as Inoue Fenduli, all good friends who have been there along my career path. And it's uh, an honor for me to be able to talk with you on this special occasion, uh, especially now that I'm father of a young daughter, and it's very important to want, 
I would like to explain why this is important from a geostrategic and geopolitical point of view, given that in recent years, Arab countries have changed a lot their political approach to genders and gender equality. And it's very important to understand in a globalized society how events evolve and and send the developments at a economic, social, and other levels. And now there is a lot of information regarding how each one of us would like to lead their life. At a political level, the Emirates is a very interesting case as currently the government has got 50% 50, 50 of the government is uh, of the government uh, post is held by women and actually women at uh, high uh, ranking uh, posts making decisions uh, for the country as well as uh, the broader area so the United Arab Emirates have got different approach, an approach to an understanding of events around the world, be it uh, southeastern Mediterranean, the Black Sea, or the Persian Gulf, Africa, Asia, and other global events. Nonetheless, the leaders of the Emirates have raised the bar regarding the participation of the, the female population. And one might say yeah, that, yes, OK, there's different uh, religious understanding of some events, not only here, but in other countries. But I could tell you that gender equality is a cultural uh, given in the area and a cultural element. because the environment, the family environment where women are fostered is crucial, a crucial issue. And women are playing a critical role in how women evolve in a tolerant society, actually tolerant and evolving society. It's a society which is globalized and at the same time traditional. I'm going to say traditional. I mean, in this sense of uh, traditional uh, Greek society, uh, the laws of the country are clear cut, setting out that women play, sh have played, and will play a key role in the development of the country. We should not forget that mothers around the world are always mothers and bringing children to life, which help our uh, world go, uh, go around. Finally, at a time of major geopolitical uh, and geostrategic changes, we are faced with, with major uh, and groundbreaking decisions that bring human security to the forefront with regards to the development of societies, be it uh, environmental policies, economic, military, educational, or other policies. At the end of the day, it would be an honor for me to see this country evolving, because as a teacher, the uh, American University in the Emirates, what I'm interested in and amazed at uh, seeing is uh, that women, female students are actively involved in the changes that occur, given that these women, just like men, uh, progress in, uh, or rather, uh, follow a career uh, in the market, in the 
this I would also like to say that the Emirates have got a global policy, a policy of tolerance, which determines the future of foreign policy and the equality policy, gender equality policy. At this point, I'd like to stop and thank you for the, my, the time I was allotted. I hope that I've contributed uh, to your discussion, to the discussion held uh, today. Uh, giving a different dimension, the dimension of the countries in this part of the world. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we thank you very much. I must admit that your, your uh, reference, your mentioning of the fact that women are treated as equal members of society in the United Arab Emirates is something that have has surprised me in a pleasant way, of course. You experience this, of course. It's not what we realize in the rest of the world. So steps have been taken, obviously, in this direction, and considerable steps. Yes, 50% of the government is made up uh, of women. Uh, and uh, imagine what's happening in an organization or in a company. And indeed, the laws changed once again. There's uh, constantly changes from 1985. So you can understand that the information concerns the equality of the, uh, in terms of workers, employees, uh, partners, and is the, all this is based on gender equality. And this is clear in everyday life and the uh, participative nature in everyday life that we see. Is there a question that somebody would like to raise? And I wish you all the best for your new daughter. Now, Let us continue now with Ambassador Catherine Bura. Thank you for your patience, Ms. Bura. Ms. Bura has had an excellent career, career at uh, diplomatic service, has held numerous diplomatic uh, posts in Greece and abroad, and also uh, served in the European Union in Brussels. Ms. Bura, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to attend and participate in this uh, symposium and for introducing me. I will speak about women in diplomacy, something that is uh, almost self-evident today, but uh, uh, the, the inclusion of women in the diplomatic sector is a development that's relatively recent, I'd say very recent in the shape and form that we see today. Up to the mid-20th century, diplomacy, just like security and defense issues were fields that belonged exclusively to men. Women could participate in these only if they were married, they were wives or a politician or a diplomat. It's only after the Second World War when diplomatic services in Europe and in the U.S. started accepting women uh, to sit the diplomatic core exams, but they were very, very skeptical vis-a-vis uh, -vis women. The discriminatory uh, behavior thus far had convinced women that it would not be possible for them to to respond and to compete in a uh, in an environment that was dominated by men. But as women started uh, participating in this area, the diplomacy started paying attention to women and asking, and there was increased participation of women in decision making. But now we see uh, countries having more and more women participating in diplomacy. But this, is there something, is there an added value that women bring to diplomacy? And what is it? Let me just give you some examples focusing on uh, issues of security. That is the subject matter of this conference today. Uh, let me first of all note, as has already been said, that the problems that concern women or are targeted to women are directly linked with the security of societies. Gender violence. 
domestic violence against women and any social marginalization of women affects the general behavior of uh, society, its policy, and the security or lack thereof cause to the surrounding people and the system. Experience has shown that participation of women in decision-making concerning peace and security can establish equality and contribute to sustainable peace because women know and uh, perceive these general uh, security-related issues that concern women. Let's take, for example, the Security Council of the United Nations. It mainly discusses conflicts, effects, threats to international security. In many of these conflicts, the primary victims are women. And specific threats that uh, uh, the th the specific threats to women are never the issue of the Security Council agenda, but for the participation and intervention of uh, member states. The first women that participated in these decision-making centers were Americans. And it was the persistence and the support of a women diplomat, Madeleine Albright to be specific, that forced the Security Council to discuss issues like human rights of women and to bring to the table policy issues that affect women and the society at large. Resolution 1325 for uh, Women, Peace and uh, Security adopted by Security Council in 2000 and Ms. Albright was then uh, State Secretary of the United States, but there, uh, she had done considerable work before that when she represented her country in the United Nations. Since then, the number of women in the organization and in the Security Council is constantly increasing. I should also note that the, the distance between what the Resolution uh, 1325 uh, stipulates and the uh, actual implementation is still uh, big. But by building on these resolutions, uh, the efforts continue, but no, no longer only by women diplomats, but are all diplomats and NGOs to improve the conditions for women on matters having to do with violence against women, slavery and rape as weapons against uh, the uh, adversaries in conference. In, family violence, uh, crimes, or honor, honor crimes, uh, trafficking in women, to just to mention a few of the problems affecting women and societies. And societies at large, given the mobility that we've uh, pointed out that we see in the world. Now, uh, peace operations and mediation. The United Nations and NATO, as we've heard from Mr. Hart, in a uh, very well documented presentation uh, or by other organizations have been they have pointed out the links between uh, women's participation and sustainable peace and security the, the participation of women in peace operations has uh, shown that it uh, can enhance the security of vulnerable groups like women and children and we've observed that for uh, many reasons that we can all understand, acceptance by local uh, communities, especially in warring areas uh, of women, is, is better, and they have better access to vulnerable groups. In the same spirit, the mediation role of women encourages women of opposing sides and accomplices to uh, to appear and resolve issues that affect the efforts for peace. The participation of women in diplomacy, we must not forget that is linked with the equitable participation of women in public life in general. It affects the participation of women in public life and is affected by it. Uh, advancement and promotion of women in international positions contributes to uh, eliminating biases as more and more women go into public life. And these biases, these prejudices started failing and being eliminated ultimately. 
the presentations of Mr. Fimiopoulos from the United Arab Emirates was very interesting. Uh, I served as uh, ambassador of Greece to the United Arab Emirates, and I would like to make reference to this country for the efforts they have made with, with a very astonishing results for the participation of women uh, and on all levels of public life. I believe that the UIA is an example of how stereotypes can change and, to, and, and in how short a period of time, if we consider that the United Arab Emirates in a few days will celebrate their 50 years from the establishment of the state. And may I remind you that in the uh, coalition operations against ISIS, the first Pilot. The first pilots that participated in this operation was a woman, and it was a woman from the United Arab Emirates. To be sure, uh, the creation of uh, women's standards and models uh, encourages the participation of women in the management of matters of concern to society, creates new new models and establishes the values of respect for human rights, equality, and uh, fairness in uh, managing international issues. There's a lot still to be done so that we can actually speak of true equality and participation of women in international political arena and diplomacy. But uh, Speaking of women in diplomacy, we must not be guided to uh, false uh, conclusions. Participation of women in diplomacy will not change uh, the world itself. It's equality that is a condition for equilibrium, progress, and development of societies, and by extension, the establishment of peace and security. It is inconceivable to have an inclusive security without the active participation of women. Equitable participation and equality it's not just a, a, a matter of numbers and percentages, but primarily it is a matter of education and uh, attitude and behavior. And on this and in this spirit, I would like to conclude with a more uh, general observation. P Professor Mr. Papa Theodoru and you, Ms. Hadziyani, discussed uh, the importance of education. And I would like in turn to stress that in the decades to come, it's the uh, adolescents and the children of today who's going to be the leaders of to tomorrow and will have the fates of the world in their hands. Education, culture, proper specialization, proper training is what will allow girls and boys to respond to the requirements and the huge challenges of the new uh, era. It's education that will allow the equitable participation in decision-making centers on all levels of uh, social contribution and will uh, strengthen the prospects for security. So on the basis of the construction for inclusive, so uh, uh, inclusive education should be uh, the basis for inclusive security. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, I think that the way Ms. Bura concluded her presentation, well, in essence, she summarized what was said by all the speakers during this panel. And once again, we see the importance of, uh, of education, of overall culture, and how important it is to educate our children, the adolescents, to be able to work together, to be able to respect each other, so as to have a better, uh, more secure, inclusive future. Thank you very much. And now, Mrs. Zoe Cordu will take my place. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Patras, and she will coordinate the next panel.
Καλησπέρα και από μένα. Good evening. We will now we're going to uh, attend the last one, not least panel of this uh, symposium. My name is uh, Zoe Cordu, I'm PhD candidate at the University of Patras. I'm also a deputy director of the uh, planning team in the ONED of ONED. In this capacity, I'd like to say that steps are taken in our country so that women, especially young women, take uh, posts in public life. And uh, but of course, there's room for a lot more to be done. Uh, and without taking more of your time, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Athanasios Kosmopoulos, who is uh, the Data Protection Officer at the Ministry of Digital Governance. And I'd like to thank you for you uh, hosting us here today, who is going to talk to us about fake news and misinformation. Fake news, as we all know, is a another yet another risk uh, for public uh, security. And Mr. Kosmopoulos is uh, more knowledgeable than any anybody else. Uh, Mr. Kosmopoulos, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. President and Madam President, uh, Mr. President, thank you for this uh, honorary invitation. I welcome you to the amphitheater of our minister. We're very happy to have the honor of hosting such a major event. I'll try and be very brief because we are running late. And uh, I'll try to give you a feeling of what is happening today when it comes to fake news and uh, misinformation. Uh, currently, we live in a world uh, that has already been excessively described by previous speakers, uh, where various types of threats are um, emerge. The notion of security has changed. There is no interior, uh, internal, external security. There are different types of threats that uh, are uh, aimed at different vulnerabilities it, uh, sh demonstrated in any structure, national or supranatural. They have to do with geopolitical factors, traditional terrorism, exploitation of natural threats where one can, when an attacker can uh, build a rationale, on which rather an, an, an attacker can build a uh, entire rationale that a state is uh, uh, unable to deal with a disaster, natural disaster, and people are burned or drowned. There are also healthcare threats such as the current pandemic. There are also factors that Mrs. Vultepsi uh, explained, le leading to the marginalization of citizens. They said radicalization. There are income inequalities that uh, are caused by social cleavages or gaps in a society that can be exploited by an attacker. Now, all this uh, can reduce uh, the um, the trust of people in rule of law. If we think of democracy as a sphere, it's made of two hemispheres. These hemispheres um, are may consist of uh, citizens and institutions, so the rule of law. The healthcare, justice, army, police, all the institutions of the rule of law. Now, what does keep these two together? There is a binder called trust. The binding material is trust, the trust of citizens in the institutions. So this is what is mostly targeted by. Uh, the various um, people who wish to perform, to, who spread the uh, fake news. They want to make drive citizens believe that they don't have police. There is no, uh, there is no police. That everyone is useless. Nothing works. Everybody is incompetent. This is the objective of the, any attacker to make the institutions of any state unreliable. We should consider, ladies and the lady, ladies and gentlemen, that we live in a fourfold crisis. We have got the financial crisis that has been uh, raging for the past ten years. 
There's also the pandemic crisis, uh, which has currently let its peak. We've got the environmental climate crisis, which uh, is uh, demonstrated through mega fires uh, and floods. And uh, the, f the energy crisis is about to, uh, which is at a nascent stage. So we've got um, a fourfold crisis currently. Because a crisis should last uh, two, four, six months, no longer than that, is why it's called uh, it's a temporary disruption of normal operation. Currently, the crisis has become a normality, especially in, uh, in uh, my ministry. We've been dealing with crisis for the past couple of years on a daily basis, which causes problems. Therefore, threatening. Hybrid threats uh, emerge, founded on four pillars, and today we're going to deal with the fir first pillar, which is uh, misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. The second is uh, the uh, exploitation of um, of social crisis, anything that can destabilize uh, the target population. The third is uh, cyber attacks, of course, and fourth pillar is uh, so-called conventional, uh, where we have got the lawfare, where there is a weaponization of law, where perpetrate there is the use of uh, diplomatic, military, and other uh, media means, excuse me, the traditional uh, threats. So this is the hybrid t landscape. And uh, this is the definition that the European Union gave back in, in 2016. The, the traditional battlefield domains in major countries, including NATO, are land, sea, air, cyberspace and space. So we've got the Space Command in the US and other countries, in China, Russia, for many years. These are the five domains, operational domains, but the sixth, the knowledge, the cognitive um, uh, domain, which is uh, the most important one currently. The new cyber attacks have uh, exceeded uh, now the definitions of uh, the previous decade. We used to say that it's a cyber attack, a destructive event, uh, were uh, aimed at uh, the BBC, aimed at a government structure in order to destabilize or disturb uh, a population. This is traditional uh, cyber attack. This is one of the three, though, currently c the the cyber landscape has currently changed. We have got the extraction of uh, data, cyber theft, aimed uh, including intellectual property, piracy, anything that has to do with data theft. That's elect electronic crime. Uh, then there is uh, subversion through social media, through directed uh, campaigns uh, of uh, the intelligence services or, uh, or other state and non-state supporters and actors. We've got involvement in elections in the US, in uh, Britain, in uh, France, and we've got data for all this. And of course, cyber es espionage, um, between uh, which can be national or industrial, like uh, Airbus with Boeing or other competitive companies, and also among nations. And of course, traditional sabotage, what we've known so far, like an attack at a government structure, or an uh, attack at a utility, or an airport, uh, having a couple of ATMs um, um, not working for a couple of weeks. Now, these are the threats that uh, have already been explained by previous speakers from uh, social, on, on social, environmental, and economic terms. But the greatest uh, threats currently the EU, as Ms. Wildepsi said, and the previous speaker, um, Ms. Safedouli, is the so-called land-scale 
scale migratory flows, climate refugees, not war refugees, war conflicts are generating um, Refugees are no longer the issues, the climate uh, change that will cause the worst mig migra migratory flows from Middle East, uh, uh, Far East and African areas due to desertification and drought or scarcity of water. We're expecting that about 50 million people will try to come to Europe in order to find food and water. Um, so the worst threat is not the destruction of uh, dog and structures and buildings, but um, fostering uh, fear, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. These are the three feelings that any attacker would like to foster in the population of any country, in the target population. In in 2014, we saw that. that Um, in Greece, there were uh, missiles in Greece was not an issue, but all of a sudden we had a lot of incidents of missiles in Greece. Greece uh, came first, and back then the uh, CDC, the Greek CDC, um, back then uh, found out that there were a lot of actions and campaigns in uh, on the internet from Russian trolls and bots that uh, uh, instigated an anti-vaccination movement. The same as we see today, we were against the, the uh, coronavirus, where we have got a lot of movements against the vaccination. Uh, all these are often instigated by directed um, accounts, 40,000 accounts, uh, that are operated by 10 people in Russia. These are usually bots or, or um, trolls. This was also identified by UNICEF and the WHO uh, as a threat, and uh, there was a study that was performed by the, Queen Mary, the University of Queen Mary in uh, London proved that uh, there's a correlation between the Russia-supported uh, political uh, parties with the anti-vaccination movement in the country. I've got the details to share with you if you want to. Uh, anyway, fake news and disinformation cause cascade dominoes effects uh, affecting multiple manifestations of life, communication, information, military, uh, security, economy, public administration. They can um, uh, launch multiple strikes and um, they can have multiple effects rather uh, following multiple strikes. And uh, the, we, knew, we now have a new attack surface. The first revolution was uh, STEAM. The second uh, industrial revolution was uh, electric power. The third was IT. Revolution four um, is um, just revolution four is a selective implementation of all these. We've got AI enhanced um, um, augmented reality, 5G, super communications, all these um, exposure to cyber-supported activities or activities make a country more vulnerable. And this is the worst problem because what counts in people's minds is uh, human brains don't have firewalls in order to filter malware. An information, a piece of news, an impression is implanted in people's brains without their understanding it. It's not a matter of propaganda because in propaganda we've got arguments. In subversion, we have got a fake. Uh, we've got fake news. We've got a uh, road reality, and it is uh, scattered or spread as a real a new reality and becomes a trading opinion. And we follow the trading opinion without even realizing it. Russia has got a unique capability in doing this. It can invent reality. It reinvents reality. And this doctrine, this is what the Turkish are successfully doing, as well as um, 
the Belarusians on the occasion of uh, the migration crisis. So we have got all these operations, but uh, most important, most importantly, though, we have got misinformation and disinformation. Dis misinformation is when you, uh, when accidentally a false um, piece of uh, news is um, uh, communicated on the internet. There was a piece of news that a director died and it became viral, and then this director came out and said, "Guys, I haven't died. I'm here. I am." But disinformation is uh, when analysts, journalists, professors at universities, uh, eminent personalities tell half truth or in, in order to achieve a specific objective. This is disinformation, and a lot of countries are experts in doing this. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are four levels of operations currently. There's the physical, where we've got the Army, Navy, Air Force, with the digital field of operations, cyberspace, and uh, uh, ITC. And then there's the cognitive. The, our resilience is poor because We've got false impressions created through internet communication and social media where a large part of our citizens use, which a lot of citizens, fellow citizens use for that information. So we need to create or to establish a holistic defense, and this is the direction in which we're moving in our uh, ministry, in order to deal with this information, uh, disinformation and misinformation phenomenon. These hybrid threads look like hybrid cars, are like hybrid cars, because uh, they are very quiet, like hybrid cars. You, you can hear them. These threads are only understood after they have been um, deployed. So resilience is very important. Is the, this is the buzzword in all NATO documents, building resilience, including the, uh, in the EU, EU as well. In six months from now, there's going to be another word, empowerment. This is going to be the target as of June 2022. So empowerment, everybody together, whole of government, whole of government, whole of the society approaches, including universities, NGOs, citizens, civil society, like Mrs. The, uh, the NGO of Mrs. Mitsak and Mr. Georgiou. Um, large NGOs that uh, promote security work in this direction alongside uh, the universities and the private sector and then the government, in order of us together can deal with this major challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cosmopoulos. Let me stress of all that you said how important, how dangerous the security of our planet is. Just a small team of 10 Russians who can distribute fake news uh, relating to vaccination, de despite the huge efforts made by all countries in the world for their vaccination campaigns. And also, point out what you said about disinformation. Well, it's uh, quite often we see an article and we read the article. Uh, we we see a title, we read the article, and more often than not, the article has nothing to do with the title. Moving on, I will give the floor to Ms. Elena Lazaru. The congratulations. I uh, had very interesting things. I, I do have these concerns uh, regarding what is happening. When you're saying that you're doing building resilience and empowerment, you think that this can happen on a national level, or does this require cooperation with international organizations in the framework of a global governance? And secondly, if you can we can share with us uh, uh, the parameters based on which you are creating or building this empowerment. For your first question, I can tell you that indeed it is uh, 
uh, general problem it doesn't concern um, it's not a member state issue it is indeed important but in order for a country to be able to uh, team up with other countries at the european level there is a working group on hybrid which works to build toolbox like they've built a cyber toolbox right now the country representatives are working on this i am a country representative in the european cybersecurity competence center in bucharest we work collectively but this requires an internal structure as well you see that suddenly it's very important the, you see that uh, the crisis in the poland belarus borders is an outstanding threat it is a greatest threat for the destabilization of the european union and when we ask them i personally ask them you know the same happened one year ago in the greek turkish birds no difference why wasn't it an outstanding threat there is different perception so we are moving ahead we are doing some we're working on things uh, finland and the netherlands have prepared also something other countries are still trying to find their way and things will be announced uh, by when things are ready they will be announced by uh, competent persons let's now give the floor to elena lazar who is with us online Ellen Lazar is acting head of external policies units, the European Parliamentary Research Services. Ms. Lazar, you have the floor. Well, uh, good afternoon from Brussels. Thank you. I'd like to thank very much Ms. Mitsako, Mr. Afanduli, and other organizers for this invitation. I, w I, I listened very attentively to the presentation of Mr. Cosmopoulos and Mrs. Bura because they're both relevant to what I wanted to say, but in specific, by listening to Mr. Cosmopoulos, it's like listening to what is happening in Brussels right now with the discussion for the strategic compass and our day to day work of what is happening on the Polish uh, Belarus uh, borders. And uh, uh, undoubtedly, the prevailing climate is that defense and security is indeed in the spirit of this. Uh, conference today a lot more than the traditional uh, sense of security and defense that we had in mind. But I was not asked to talk about this today. I was asked to talk about gender and career in foreign policy and international security. And if I understood correct, correctly from Ms. Mitsako, what she asked me to do is to bring this discussion to what is feasible, what is tangible, and specifically for a, a young person today that uh, has chosen a career, a career in this area. Uh, I could say that it's not an inaccessible area, but it's sometimes difficult to access. And I admit that uh, most of the discussions I managed to hear are interrelated with what we said and i try to be brief because we've taken up a lot of time but i'm very happy that uh, a phd candidate is moderating this panel and i hope that we will be uh, addressing dr kodu very soon because i believe that this issue has to do it uh, concerns young people a lot let me start by saying that gender and career in international policy and international security is not just men and women. There is a great debate on the gender today, which is uh, which has many more uh, aspects. This issue has a lot more aspect, but since most statistics that we have today concern only the distinction between men and women, I will refer to that very often, but I think a very important uh, remark on this is that in the Western world we are in the pleasant position today to have a, a greater debate on gender than just separate the distinction between men and women. Speaking of a career in international politics and specifically in security, I think that the first point I would like to raise is how a career in this uh, in this domain in this area requires the elimination of two stereotypes the first stereotype has to do with the gender roles and the second has to do with what security is let me explain myself the first part i think was raised and discussed by ms bura it's unfortunately a fact that international security 
is linked in our minds with the traditional uh, security to a great extent. There are many um, which having to do with traditional military defense, and this is due to many factors, uh, tra historic uh, and others, brings to mind the classic and outdated male role in society. Uh, and as a result, more often than not, if one speaks to an audience and asks what what does the word security and defense brings to mind? The first thing that they're going to say is weapons, and the second is uh, a, a male soldier. And this has been proven. This creates stereotypes that often uh, prevent avert women from entering in such, from pursuing such a career. I think this can be proven without a doubt with the statistics, some of which were mentioned by Miss Bura, and there are other. Uh, available statistics that one can find in various indexes such as security and in various other civil society organizations. But just to mention a few for the main domains. Indeed, in diplomacy, as Ms. Bura said, we have approximately in G20 and EU 46% of diplomats are women, but only 20% are women ambassadors. When we talk about the armies, purely military environments, 11% uh, of military uh, force are women, and in no countries of the European Union of G20, this does not exceed 20%. Uh, talk about uh, defense industry, one of five employees is women, which is very low in this specific industry. These statistics show that show beyond any doubt that it's some problem in the access of women to these professions and they have been the object of great debate today. On the other hand, of course, we see that there is empirical data that show that participation of women both in diplomacy and in peace talks, peace negotiation, mediation and other part of uh, security and defense today, they have a much better results, especially for a long-term preservation of peace and sustainable development. And I can mention, for example, that it's been proven that in peace processes, when there are women on the table, there's 30% more chance for this agreement to be observed. And uh, we've seen the role of women's organization in the civil society in preservation of peace and security in societies uh, recovering after conflicts. So we have this paradox that while there are tangible results and positive proof of women's participation in this domain, we have this huge gap between uh, male and female representation. According to some studies, in order to bridge these gaps with, at the rate we're following, we're going to need approximately 325 years in the European Union and 465 years in some other countries in order to uh, to reach uh, uh, gender parity in the military. So this is a big problem. And the first thing that would possibly lead is not to have stereotypes in relation to a career in this domain. And this uh, takes me to eliminating the second uh, stereotype. What is defense? What is security? I would uh, collectively refer to what has been discussed by I think all the previous speakers because uh, specializing in security and defense one realizes that that uh, having an holistic approach does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, engaging with security and defense has not only to do with armed conflict. And I, uh, what I mean is this, all that we've been heard today for the holistic addressing of security and defense mean that apart from conflict, which is what comes to mind uh, immediately, there is also prevention the building of resilience, early warning, and, and foresight are key elements uh, of security and defense today. And we see this both 
in the direction that the European Union is following right now, uh, the direction is taken in the global strategy of 2016 and now continues with the strategic compacts, uh, compass that's been discussed now, and NATO with the 2030 agenda and various other uh, things that have been discussed today. This holistic approach means that when we talk about security and defense, we're talking about addressing a, some, a, a set of threats which include climate, cyber security, uh, misinformation, terrorism, economic crisis, and insecurity, among others. And I don't know if I can share with you my desktop if i don't know if i can do uh, but this is an uh, uh, an image is a project that we have in the eprs so we try every year to assess the degree of threat for a country we have 137 countries from various threats and the interesting that i've i've included in this screen is i've chosen four countries Central African Republic, Afghanistan, Libya, and Somalia, countries where the European Union either carries out an operation now, and Afghanistan, of course, because it is in the eye of the cyclone. And if we take a look, the average is the blue line, and the orange is the total. Uh, the lowest the score for a country the more, uh, the greater the threat from a specific, the greater a specific threat. And we see, this is just an example, we see here that these countries, uh, the country with the greatest uh, insecurity, usually have a great threat from climate change, from, uh, from uh, insecurity in cyberspace, insecurity in energy, a great threat uh, to democracy. They're threatened by misinformation. They haven't built their resilience. So we see that in general in the world today, the countries that are considered the centers of crisis are threatened by a set of threats. And not only because there is an armed conflict or uh, some civil or other war. So security today is inclusive, is complex, is holistic. What does this mean in terms of career? It means that the opportunities for employment in this domain require, require a great uh, spectrum of uh, studies, skills, and capabilities. Uh, sci with scientists that work on climate, science, uh, IT scientists, Uh, development policy theoreticians, uh, scientists working on climate change, but also on food technologies, food issues, water issues. All, all these people have uh, very important roles to play in the development of defense and security. So a career in security should not be considered through the uh, narrow framework of geopolitics, but it's a, it's a broad uh, spectrum of disciplines that needs to be uh, developed, that, that uh, young people should uh, develop in order to be able to follow this uh, career. And these are disciplines that institutions need in order to put forward to promote this uh, climate of security and defense. I would like to conclude with saying that there are, however, some positive aspects today. For example, in the United States, for the first time since 2019, four of the five CEOs of the largest defense suppliers in the U.S. are women in huge companies. And, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, women and gender uh, agenda uh, in security and defense is a matter that is uh, that concerns daily, especially the uh, parliaments. I believe that uh, last week uh, Euro MP Hara Moynen did uh, an excellent presentation saying that 
She was a member of the of a mission to Iraq, and she was the only woman. And she made a recommendation in the parliament and saying, "How can I go to Iraq and say, why don't you have more women uh, in the election when in our mission I was the only woman?" And I think that the fact that there is this, that this is in the agenda, that there are examples of women who can share their experiences is truly a very positive step, uh, as are the various programs that are being uh, put forward by NATO and like this conference right now. To conclude, let me say that education, which is an issue raised by all, is truly a very important uh, uh, element to help eliminate stereotypes and put forward new ideas for gender roles and also the promotion of different way of thinking for security and defense and also promoting digital know-how, STEM, mathematics, many women that have succeeded in this area, in this domain, they say that these type of skills have helped them considerably and also a type of training that would promote uh, negotiation skills, uh, debate skills, public speaking skills. There are many skills that uh, people need to investigate so that young people can understand and uh, seek a career and pursue a career in this domain. And finally, definitely networking and developing, fostering relations with mentors and examples of how truly uh, the uh, gender should not play an issue anymore in a career in defense and security. And to conclude by saying that each one of us should have the responsibility to eliminate the stereotypes. I was at an event last week with a new colleague in the area of defense, and when somebody asked her a question referring to, to referring to her as Miss, and and she referred to that gentleman saying the uh, middle-aged gentleman in the audience, uh, because it's something that we do. Uh, sometimes when the, but the knowledge uh, should prevail to the age or the gender. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity. I would like to congratulate you once again for this event. Thank you, Mrs. Lazaro. People like you, with your knowledge and experience, uh, have to be highlighted and promoted in order to, in order for more women to overcome the gender issue and uh, uh, dare to, to follow careers in international relations. Now, I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Uh, Jana Hormova, uh, Secretary General for Demography and Family Policy, Gender Equality, take the floor. Uh, based on uh, my contacts with the uh, Secretary, Secretary General, uh, I know that this is uh, a Secretariat uh, with a uh, uh, lot of work and uh, no working hours because they work uh, long, long hours and they deal and they have a huge agenda. Thank you. Reaching the end of approaching rather the end of today's uh, event i'd like to congratulate the organizers for the very interesting uh, contributions and i will uh, promise to be as uh, brief as possible because a lot of uh, issues and perspectives have already been analyzed now the th the, th the three key words that i'd like to reiterate education empowerment and the importance of uh, eliminating stereotypes. I'd like that the 2021 is a major, is a very significant year because uh, we have got in consultation, open consultation uh, with the various bodies, not only of the government, but also the bodies of uh, organizations of the society, uh, two action plans. The action plan for women, peace and security, elaborate for the first time regarding 
the implementation of Resolution 1325 of the UN and was placed in uh, con public consultation in uh, May 2021. And the second is the National Plan on Gender Equality, which again was elaborated through an inclusive um, procedure in dialogue with uh, the competent bodies, the ministries and civil society. And it was in consultation, which was uh, completed in July 2021, and then uh, approved by the cabinet. This is very important. It's very important because all the actions that are to be implemented by government organizations are known to everyone. Uh, and uh, everyone knows uh, the plans uh, for the promotion of uh, gender equality. It's also very important to see how the two action plans were elaborated uh, based on the recent law that was passed regarding gender equality in our country. Gender mainstreaming was uh, fully adopted. Gender mainstreaming means that we can't promote gender equality unless every government uh, or, or if every government uh, body deals with its issues as if uh, gender equality uh, is not on their agenda. So gender equality has to be reflected in every action. Therefore, it is very important that during the elaboration of the national action plans in specific areas and the highly sensitive uh, field of uh, peace and security, account has been taken uh, of the General Secretary for Equality. Now, if these two action plans are f uh, studied, one realizes that they're not in silos, they're not isolated from each other. In essence, they're interactive. They, they're interactive as follows. The National Plan for Women in Peace and uh, Security aims has six targets. Prevention of uh, armed conflicts, uh, protection of uh, w women and uh, girls, and establishment of mechanisms to prevent any form of gender violence, relief and recovery from uh, post-war environments, um, involvement in leadership of women in all areas concerning peace and security, and systematic um, horizontal mainstream, gender mainstreaming uh, in all policies, including uh, the action plan for women and uh, in, in peace and security. And there are five pillars upon which this is founded, this is, relies on, and I will briefly actually uh, present them. The first pillar is prevention of armed uh, conflicts, gendered violence, sexual um, exploitation and abuse. Now, how does this interact with uh, the action plan uh, for gender equality, which was uh, elaborated based on the European uh, action plans? It um, is in, in it does so through horizontal systematic education of the entire public administration in equality issues and uh, initially pertaining to the implementation of the custom of the Istanbul Treaty, which is the binding treaty on the uh, prevention of uh, violence against women and the training of the entire public administration and armed forces staff in the implementation of the principles uh, of gender equality the second pillar is the balanced uh, gender uh, representation in public life and decision-making bodies in the Action Plan for Women in uh, Peace and Security is uh, enhanced by the, the support of our se Secretariat through the 
Gender Observatory, Gender Equality Observatory, which is run by our Secretariat and is a competent uh, government body to monitor statistics. And um, in, in every collective body and women's participation in representation. Ms. Lazaro talked about women's representation in panels created and the, uh, how women are treated. And I'm we're talking about panels regarding uh, peace and security. This is not the only issue in all panels. It has been observed that women are underrepresented. And for this underrepresentation to stop, what is required is me positive discrimination measures to be taken, uh, that is, uh, measures in favor of women's uh, representation. So uh, until we reach the, we, we do not need quotas anymore. And the inclusion of, uh, or rather, and women's empowerment in throughout our actions in order for them to claim their role and position in panels and uh, leadership positions. Third pillar of the action plan for women in peace and security has to do with women's uh, protection from uh, gendered and uh, family violence. It was mentioned earlier that there is a network that we run in our secretariat to deal with this phenomenon. This network is made up by the hotline, by a hotline, 43 consulting centers and uh, 19 hostels. The role, shelters, excuse me, the role of the hotline is uh, key and is key because Information can be given not only to victims of uh, family or gendered violence, but also their social environment. Instructions are given, management instructions are given in order to stopping observers and tolerate such phenomena. And as Ms. Buddha said, in uh, her talk, it's very important that the entire society condemns this phenomena. But in order for everyone to condemn this, everyone has to be properly educated. Apart from workshops and talks and uh, awareness raising actions, the, the hotline provides specific instructions and guidelines to the social environment of the victims in order to stop tolerating such a phenomenon. In the 43 counseling centers, and uh, this is important also for the next pillar, the relief of uh, the phenomena, or the relief of women, relief and recovery of women, the network of the 43 counseling centers provides these women quite systematically with the psychological support, empowerment of women themselves, improving their self-esteem, labor uh, cons uh, consulting, and legal support. And all these services are free. It is very important not only to call women and victims at large, gendered uh, violence victims to stop their silence, but also to set up, to provide them with a framework that can empower them at every step. The fifth pillar of the National Action Plan for Women in uh, Peace and Security is the promotion of this agenda, the discussion of this agenda. The National Action Plan, as indicated, uh, if one reads the entire text, is um, very significant, very important for the empowerment of women. And it's both a pillar 
the horizontal mainstreaming, genomic streaming, calls for the involvement of everyone. And if one reads the action plan, one will realize that there are individual actions from each ministry, and it has been elaborated with the contribution not only of all the competent ministries, but also with the contribution of uh, civil society organization as well as local and regional authorities. Therefore, there is a cascade, there are cascade actions in order to empower and reinforce women in order to uh, be involved in all uh, fora. Concluding, I'd like to say in, in 2021, we have got a third national action plan, the na national action plan for the um, LGBT community. And we have got the opening of the debate uh, regarding any form of violence and sexual harassment with the Me Too movement. Therefore, we're at a stage where we have got, on the one hand, uh, specific proposals and actions, policy actions, uh, open for debate. And on the other hand, we have got the public debate on issues that, uh, until the beginning of the 2020, used to be considered taboo uh, topics that are not to be in a public dialogue, that uh, should not be discussed in order to reach some sort of uh, understanding. It is very important that this is taking place now. It's very important that there are not issues that are swept under the rug. As uh, the Deputy Minister said and other speakers, there are specific actions in education There are on going workshops for the elimination of stereotypes and concluding i'd like to s talk about the importance of uh, promoting stem sciences uh, to women and girls in order to change the perception uh, tomorrow and uh, apart from our collaboration with civil society organizations and uh, stem workshops for promotion of stem workshops for women and girls there is also the work of our uh, Secretary General, Innovate, which is an innovation center for women's entrepreneurship. Therefore, with this concurrent and systematic and inclusive approach, and the implementation of the action plans, we believe that uh, we're taking small steps that are bringing us much closer to the implementation of actual, uh, of real equality. Mr. Nazaro said that at the European Union level, the specific security issues would take, for, for it would take us hundreds of years in order to ensure gender equality, the, the European Union reports regarding uh, substantial equal, gender equality, that is the post-COVID era, in order to implement, uh, um, to achieve rather, real uh, gender equality will take nine, nine, 99 years. It is true that uh, inclusive democracy and inclusive security that we're discussing today, that one way or another, the uh, upon the values, the value core of our society. And this core cannot change from one side and overnight. It's going to take a lot of years. The question is whether in the course to achieving these targets, we're moving in the right direction, we're on track, and to whether there is involvement and collaboration in the core of this uh, course. And I believe that these two principles have been observed so far. And this makes us much more optimistic than any other predictions or forecasts about the achievement of uh, in, uh, gender equality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hormova. So we have two national plans that you briefly presented. 
which undoubtedly give fertile ground for future actions and why not uh, organizations like women in international uh, security might not have a, a raison d'etre, which uh, that would be very good news. Let me release the f this two panel, uh, the two panelists right now to call the the next two panelists. I would like to ask Mr. Stereos Katichoridis and Mr. Th Theodos Georgiou to come to the panel. Ο κύριος Στέργιος Κατηχωρήτης είναι αρχιτέκτονας και κοινωνιολόγος και μέλος του Δουσού των Γυναικών στη Διεθνή Ασφάλεια Ελλάδος, γιατί σίγουρα ε, έχουμε καταλάβει ότι για να υπέλθει η ισότητα των δύο φύλων θέλουμε δουλειά επίσης και από τα δύο φύλλα. Κύριε Στέργιο, ο λόγος σε εσάς. Ναι, μόνο που επειδή δεν έχουμε και πολύ χρόνο, συμπερασματικά τελικά από όλοι από όλα τα λεχθέντα στη θαυμάσιο, θαυμάσιο αυτό συμπόσιο, το οποίο θα αφήσει αποτύπωμα στην ιστορία, πραγματικά δηλαδή. Ε, βλέπουμε ότι στην εποχή μας φαίνεται ότι η ιστορία αλλάζει, αλλάζει σελίδα, ένα νέο διεθνές σύστημα γεννιέται και ένας άλλος κόσμος ανατέλει βιώνοντας την τεχνολογική, ψηφιακή, ρομποτική επανάσταση μαζί με τα προβλήματα της κλιματικής αλλαγή. Όμω αυτό το νέο σταυροδρόμι της ανθρωπότητας επαναφέρει ορμητικά τις εθνοκεντρικές στρατηγικές. Αμφισβητώντας τη λογική της μητρικής αγκαλιάς του ενοποιημένου χώρου και του ενοποιημένου χωριού. Αντίρροπες γεωπολιτικές και κύρια γεωοικονομικές δυνάμεις συγκρούονται με αμφίβολο το που θα ισορροπήσουν. Θα κυριαρχήσει η λογική της παγκοσμιοποίησης, της δημοκρατίας, της ειρήνης, της αρετής και της ασφάλειας του μητρικού, θα λέγαμε, εμείς ή θα επανέλθουμε στον κόσμο των εθνών κρατών, του ανδρικού εγώ και των συγκρούσεων. Θα πάμε σε ένα μείγμα αυτών ή σε κάτι άλλο. Αυτό καλούνται σήμερα να αντιμετωπίσουν τα κοινωνικά ε, ακριβώς σύνολα. Κυρίε και κύριοι, το γενικό συμπέρασμα είναι ότι σε όλη την ιστορική διαχρονία αποδεικνύεται ως κυρίαρχος μοχλός των εξελίξεων και ιδιαίτερα σήμερα η γυναίκα. Η παραγωγική διαδικασία έχει πάψει πλέον να κρατιέται, να συντηρείται και να οικοδομείται πάνω στην ανθρώπινη μυϊκή δύναμη και συνορμή. Θέλει περισσότερο την εξυπνάδα. Θέλει περισσότερο τη θέληση, θέλει περισσότερο την ειρήνη. Και κάτι άλλο. Σήμερα ο πλανήτης βιώνει μια τραγική πανδημία. Και ήθελα εδώ να κλείσω θυμίζοντας τη ρίση του George Washington. The crisis opportunity now. Και την ευκαιρία δεν τη παταλάς. Να είστε καλά. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ και για τη χρόνου. Thank you very much. And to conclude this uh, symposium, we the, the final things in this conference, we have two videos by Zeta Macri, Deputy Minister of Education and Religious Affairs, a member of Parliament. And so let's let's watch the video of Ms. Macri. Now, before uh, before the conclusions, could I possibly have the f uh, the floor, please? Yes, we'll we'll first uh, watch the videos and then uh, give you the floor.
Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this um, invitation. There is a profound sense of uh, responsibility that brings us here today to this um, symbol, uh, uh, event. The Social Front Fights of Women to uh, consolidate their rights, their daily effort in order to play their multiple roles, uh, their uh, uh, offer is um, very important. Women are worth major uh, values and um, and uh, Η γυναίκα στον 21ο αιώνα που οι διακρίσει και οι διαχωρισμοί μεταξύ των φύλων έχουν αρχίσει να υποχωρούν, συνεχίζει. Women still vindicate their rights for the present, the future, and try to um, keep, maintain their course over time. In recent years, we hear the civil society term increasingly often an open society that fosters the m message of uh, democracy and freedom and uh, is about uh, social inclusion, social participation, involvement, um, mutuality, and, and solidarity and tolerance. This is uh, the kind of values that we want to and uh, over to our children, to embed uh, to our children from the very first years in uh, at school. Through uh, education, education reveals values such as working together, mutual respect, uh, uh, no exclusion, collective conscience, volunteerism, and sustainability. This strengthens key and fundamental skills of pupils upgrades the level of uh, pedagogical practices. We must encourage in all ways the participation of pupils in education programs relating to the skills of active citizens, like empathy, support of human rights, and fostering interpersonal relations. We believe and we work on integration, uh, in inclusive education, and the promotion of common values through synergies and programs seeking and applying the newest approaches for the contribution of education in the creation of active citizens. We promote activities fostering the pedagogic methodology and the development of skills through skills workshops which proves the shaping of active citizens. Social cohesion and solidarity is a matter of education, of culture. It's a sign of democracy. Democracy, society must train itself and have greater, greater sensitivity. Gender violence violates the entire society. Nobody is left unaffected. I would like to point out the work of the Ministry of Education that is trying to inform and contribute to prevention gender violence. We teach the children mutual respect, diversity, social responsibility, human rights. We foster skills and we give pupils equipment that will help them become fair people, creative people, and free citizens. We uh, help teachers b obtain new skills. We offer them tools to study and inform their pupils on these issues. And the platform of the Educational Policy Platform, uh, teachers can find manuals and instructions for the prevention and protection of uh, sexual identity, the protection of family. Uh, specific educational uh, programs of, of the educational institutes. There is a program for creating uh, relations between genders. The program uh, div is a program 
the two-hour workshop for raising the awareness based on the rights and focuses on gender. It aims at uh, equipping students with skills, capabilities, and values that will help them develop a positive uh, aspect of their sexuality. Another program, The World Upside Down. This edition entitled The World from the Beginning is a result of the work of the Center for uh, Gender Equality Issues with UNICEF. This aims at the prevention combating violence against women and family violence. The, the Istanbul Convention. The purpose is to raise concerns and to be a starting point for discussion among the young for the prevention and combating of gender violence. And it is presented in four languages. Moving forward addressed to uh, school students and the purpose is to ensure the dignity of each person the free freedom from this uh, from any uh, from any uh, negative behaviors and uh, helping students eliminate stereotypes and prevent social exclusion Digital Education for Gender Equality, implemented by the Smile of a Child and Convey. Convey program is addressed to secondary education students to raise awareness regarding the gender stereotypes and the sexuality of women in media and the way how this contributes to violence and harassment. This material uh, is made up of an interactive application that aims at changing behaviors uh, and attitudes of uh, young regarding violence and harassment. The theme is uh, experiential and theoretic on gender stereotypes, sexualization in the new digital environment, gender violence, sexual violence and harassment, management of sensitive issues. Uh, gender identities, another program. is implemented by the Ministry of uh, Labor. Another program, uh, Education in Human Rights, implemented by Amnesty International. Another program, what if it were you? The Ministry of Education with the responsibility of disabled children, the adolescents of families and society, supports initiatives for the protection and safety of the physical and mental health of children and the uh, discovery of abuse cases. We create the conditions to help children speak out of what uh, concerns them and recognize and protect themselves from risk, defend their rights and stand against all unfair behavior. This will be a start for discussion between the, among the young for the prevention and combating of uh, gender violence. Information and awareness is always the first step along with prevention and security following closely and the ministry and education plays a leading role to stop the silence and break the stereotypes. It is the uh, priority of the ministry to uh, address this phenomenon and stereotypes and various phenomena. And we support our schools with 2,800 positions for psychologists and social workers by establishing the uh, school life consultant and the constant uh, preparation of various programs. The participation of teachers, massive participation of teachers, is indicative of the trust that they show in the ministry's uh, initiatives. We stand by our teachers, we stand by the children, and we create the prospects of a better world without uh, delaying our concerted actions. We give society the education that it deserves in an upgraded uh, environment today and tomorrow. We set education on solid foundations for the new generation that takes action and is getting involved in the global realities and cares for the planet and sustainability. Especially today with the pandemic, 
that uh, affects the entire world, we urge uh, young people to present their proposal on how they envision their future based on the values of democracy, equality, economy, and equal opportunity, and how they envision a society that does not see diversity as inequality, a society without discrimination, but it's a canvas for anyone can express themselves. We need initiatives that promote uh, solidarity and democracy, and democracy. We create opportunities for young people to express themselves and express their views as responsible and active citizens in the thought that they can jointly help develop the future. We thank Mrs. Macri, and uh, now we're going to watch the video that we received from the Minister Stylianidis, the Minister for Climate uh, uh, Crisis and uh, Civil Protection, Mr. Stylianidis. It's really my great honor to participate in this Well, uh, I'd like to say... ...national security, alas, in cooperation with the Greek uh, Association for Atlantic and uh, European Cooperation. The topics of discussion are really crucial. Interdependence, resilience, and inclusive security are really important. And the meaning of these uh, words today is more relevant than ever. I really apologize for not being able to attend in person this meeting, unfortunately, due to prior obligations overseas. But uh, allow me, however, to thank the organizing committee for this invitation and for the uh, great opportunity to speak to you even uh, virtually. Dear friends, there is no doubt that climate change is real. It's not fake news. <laughs> climate change is happening just now. It is a hard reality, a reality that uh, affects uh, all of us. Extreme weather phenomena, steadily rising temperatures, heat uh, waves, droughts, fires, wildfires, forest fires, and heavy rainfall and floods are part of our everyday lives. All of the above incidents are becoming more and more frequent, more and more intense, unfortunately. And such phenomena are observed everywhere, all over the world. During 2021, we witnessed record high temperatures in Greece and in Russia, storms across the UK, cyclones in Fiji, winter storms in Texas, record-breaking snowfall in Madrid, in Spain, floods in Belgium, in Germany, in Western Europe, and hurricanes in the USA. Moreover, in our country, in Greece, we had the recent examples of the extreme weather phenomena of Athena and Balos. You all remember last summer with high temperatures consistently above 40 degrees Celsius, and the following catastrophic mega fires. Dear colleagues, we should all accept that our daily lives have really changed, and our everyday lives are really completely different than some years ago. We are now living in a climate crisis, and we insist on this call. A crisis with really negative consequences for the environment, definitely, 
to our ecosystems in our economies affects our societies a lot and at the same time human health and our prosperity. And unfortunately, the scientific prediction, see the scientific for, forecast for our neighborhood, the Eastern Mediterranean neighborhood, are really alarming. So, ladies and gentlemen, the need for immediate action is now really imperative. Keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, a commitment which is really reiterated in the Glasgow Climate Pact and COP26, is an ambitious goal for us to succeed this really very ambitious goal, we need to focus in collective action. We need to stay in open and structured, structured dialogue and, of course, cooperation between all stakeholders, including the citizens, is more than paramount. It is really necessary to embrace a new way of thinking, to adopt a new mentality and to move beyond as business as usual. And uh, we insist on this because it's the only way that we can go through new mentality which embraces the meaning of the word interdependency. Dear friends, a society which recognizes that the battle against climate change, climate crisis requires a collective approach. It is the only way to see win-win situation. No doubt that all of us, we are, in, we are all in the same boat. The planet is common. <laughs> and this is exactly one of our main objectives as Ministry of Climate Crisis and Civil Protection. Key pillars in our policies are, first, to promote a multilateral cooperation, to facilitate collective action, to engage in a structural dialogue, to promote the exchange of best practices and knowledge, and to cultivate a common front against the climate crisis. And uh, the actions of our ministry are guided by three key words, very well known uh, internationally, especially in this field. Prevention, preparedness, and resilience. And first and foremost, we need, of course, education of the people about climate change, about climate crisis, maybe is the most important infrastructure in order to see the things really to be changed. And we, we insist to see education for the early stages, from the kindergarten. My dear friends, education, as always, is key. Protecting our common future means that we are, are together in action. We are, are together in prevention. We are, are together in preparedness. And education, it maybe, is the first action. As a ministry, as a new ministry, we are working to create a model training center to promote education on climate change throughout society. Furthermore, we are moving forward with a new climate crisis and civil protection strategy for Greece, a strategy that uh, emphasizes on public awareness and education. First step, embraces and promotes voluntary, voluntary, volunteering system, really very important steps, and 
also promotes the active participation of civil, of civil society and of our citizens in all actions of the civil protection mechanisms in our country, in our national system. A strategy that and can develop environmental awareness collectively. It's also a key word, collectively. A strategy that uh, lays down the necessary conditions for us, for our system, to strengthen the resilience of our country to climate change. Don't underestimate resilience because maybe is the major fact of any infrastructure in order to deal with the climate crisis in the future. To this end, and uh, we, uh, we expect uh, we are uh, creating a National Center for Crisis Management which will have a modern central database. Very important step in order to be all together, all authorities, uh, the state and the local authorities, and also the scientific uh, family. Through this center, be able to monitor first how climate change is evolving in Greece with our scientific uh, um, councils and other uh, universities and so on. Second, the effects of climate change on the country's resilience and, of course, uh, to evaluate and to following the danger from all types of natural disasters. This will allow us to, prior, right, uh, to put priorities and update, and update our actions accordingly to the European and uh, uh, international standards. At the same time, we are creating a benchmark system enabling us to monitor progress in critical areas of climate change adaptation. Adaptation is also a key word. In this way, we'll be able to send the uh, ambitions, but really achievable goals. We are very, very in favor about feasible goals. This is our uh, way of thinking. Dear friends, the security and the future of our planet is an issue that definitely concerns all of us. The response to this climate crisis is a complex equation which requires synergies, requires, as I already said, collaboration. Synergies and partnerships which promote dialogue and collective action are more than necessary. And at the same time, we are going together to strengthen our resilience to the impact of the climate crisis. Dear friends, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. And um, I wish you um, a really very deep dialogue in this very demanding field. And uh, um, I can say that um, when you um, will be in Greece, we can uh, host you in our ministry in order to extend our discussion and our dialogue in these our common goals. Thank you so much again. It's really my great honor to participate in this international symposium organized by women in international security, Hellas, in cooperation with the Greek Association for Atlantic and the European Cooperation. The topics of discussion are really crucial. Interdependence, resilience, and inclusive security are really important. And the meaning of these uh, words today is more relevant than ever. I really apologize for not being able to attend in person this meeting. Unfortunately, due to prior obligations 
overseas. But uh, allow me, however, to thank So today's symposium is going to be concluded by, uh, closed by Mr. Thedosis Georgiou. Thank you, Zoe. There's one, one conclusion I would like to write. Women are more resilient than men. <laughs> it's the nature made them more resilient and they're more patient. So thank you very much for your presence here. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this marathon discussion. We could have had a two-day discussion, but anyway, we can't do much, unfortunately, because of COVID. And the Women in International Security is something that is underway. We wish the best of luck and we'd like to thank everybody, everybody who helped organize this. Uh, the technical staff, the uh, interpreters who contributed for uh, everyone to be able to attend. Just just one note, just one uh, thing, uh, Chairman. Uh, I mean, my experience six years as a director of a psychiatric hospital, let me say that the men patient because of uh, some sort of disappointment because of women, statistically, they are many more than women who have not experienced equal number of problems caused by men, statistically. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you should discuss this. We should uh, elaborate on this very soon. Hopefully, we'll see you in uh, future uh, actions. Thank you very much.